Welcome and thank you for coming out to listen to this very important presentation. My name is Dale Lepke and I live with my wife Mary on Sanderson Road in Gillies Bay. Friends and family know us better as Marcy and Pops. Our family purchased this property in 1949. Our three children jointly own the property adjacent to our home, and our eight grandchildren are the fourth generation to enjoy and maintain homes at Gillies Bay. Our family is greatly concerned about Lafarge's coal storage expansion proposal. The purpose of this open meeting is to allow residents of Texada access to information regarding the possible impacts of this proposal. This meeting was organized by individual Texada residents who are concerned about the health and environmental risks related to this proposal for the Texada Coal Terminal. In a moment, I'd like to introduce our speaker, but first, uh, there are a number of guests, that I, special guests I would like to uh, recognize in the audience. First of all, Carol Ann Leishman from Pebble in the Pond Society in Powell River is here. You may have signed her petition and letter, which she recently presented to the Powell River Regional District Board, requesting rural directors to not support the quote, proposed coal port. Guy Gettner and his wife Shirley are also here this evening. Welcome. Guy is a former Delta North MLA, now retired and living in Powell River. Guy produced the flyer we are handing up this evening. Welcome, Guy and Shirley, and thank you very much. Donald Gordon is in the audience. Oh, he's Donald. No, he's in Comox. No, oh. oh. The flight got bogged in Comox. Yes. Oh. Hi, Donald. <laughs> <laughs> Laura Waltz. Laura is the editor of the Powell River newspaper. She's playing an active role reporting on Tex Haven's proposed coal expansion. And we are pleased to have her here. Welcome, Laura. And last but not least is Owen Mority from Delta. He is, filming, he is filming the event. Owen is also broadcasting the event over the live internet for our neighbors on the Ski Island, the Sunshine Coast, and the Lower Mainland. Owen has been filming Dr. James throughout his speaking tours for a number of months now. You can visit his website, nomorecoalexports.com. Welcome, Owen, back there in the dark. <laughs> Information regarding the meeting format and timelines. Following Dr. James' talk at approximately 8, we will immediately go into a question and answer format. We value everyone's opinion here, and we ask everyone to please be respectful and listen to each other carefully. We will also be receiving questions from our live viewers via the internet. Richard Fletcher from Gilly's Bay will moderate the question and answer period. After the question answer period, roughly 8.45, boy, we're organized. <laughs> we will end the evening with an open discussion of where do we go from here, what do we do next. And Linda Henningsen from Gillies Bay will begin this discussion. We should be wrapping up by about 9.30. If you need to leave the hall during the meeting, please use the back entrance. It's with the red, bright red exit sign. Also, if you're interested in more information regarding the coal expansion, also please leave your name and contact number before you leave with Cora and Diana at the front desk. I don't know where the front desk has gone to, but it's still up there. <laughs> Thank you. Our guest speaker this evening is Dr. Frank James, who is a health officer for San Juan County, Washington, and for the Nooksack Indian Tribe. In addition, clinical associate professor of public health at the University of Washington for over 20 years. He is also one of the founding members of the Whatcom Docs, a group of over 200 Whatcom County physicians who are deeply concerned about the health and safety impacts of the proposed Cherry Point coal shipping terminal. They are calling for an independent, objective health impact assessment of the project including the impact of transporting coal to local communities. I'd also like to mention and thank Dr. James personally, who overcame with grim determination the fog and uh, 
was up very early this morning to make it here. Certainly shows his commitment to come to this small community. Please join me in welcoming Dr. King. Thank you very much. Um, now we'll see if technology continues to work. <laughs> Maybe, huh? Well, I want to thank all of you for coming. Uh, I also want to say that uh, I did get up at 5 o'clock this morning and uh, when the flight got canceled because of the fog and uh, had the pleasure of uh, riding up with Owen uh, on the many ferries it takes to get here. And it's, it's a big problem because you find this place and it's incredibly beautiful. I mean, I want to come back. Uh, somebody's going to have to help me with the technology because actually the slides that were up here aren't coming through now. Um, can you turn it on maybe? There you go. The other thing while they're struggling with that, let me just say there, that looks like it, it made things flash up here. Maybe they'll flash up there now. Yeah, there we are. Technology does work. Um, so just to say, I, I wanted to thank one more time a member of the audience, and that's, that's uh, uh, Mr. Gendner. Uh, there are times when I'm not very hopeful, and when I read what he sent out, I became much more hopeful. To know that political leadership was taking a stand, and a brave stand. Um, Things are very different in Canada than they are in the States. Uh, we have a Clean Water Act where I can sue my government uh, if I don't think they're doing things right. And if I win, they pay my legal costs. You don't have that. We have a Clean Air Act that uh, much the same thing can take place under. Our ports are elected officials, our port commissioners. And if we don't like what they're doing, we can vote them out of office. And that happens at a local level. None of those protections are offered to you. Uh, so. Honestly, in the end, I believe that it's most likely this will require the leadership of elected political officials. And I think it's extremely important that, that people take the brave stand that, that uh, this particular MLA took. Um, he didn't just take a stand, he sent this out, if I understand, to every single constituent he had. Um, there are other acts like that that I've seen taken on the other side. I was invited to come up and, and lecture and give a brief presentation to the, to the uh, city council in Vancouver. And everyone that spoke, uh, spoke uh, in favor of them zoning coal ports out of existence in Vancouver, except for one person. And he was actually a member of parliament. And uh, it was sort of unfortunate in a way, but it also, I think, spoke legions of truth, and that is that uh, it was very clear that, that their rezoning coal ports out of Vancouver was going to pass. In fact, ultimately it passed 9 to 2. But as that became clear, even after this man had had his turn to speak, he came back to the microphone without being invited and basically screamed at the councillors and said, if we want to put a coal port in Vancouver, we will shove it down your throat. Um, because of what he did, I'm convinced there will never be a coal port in Vancouver. <laughs> Despite the fact that the federal government here does have the authority to do that and probably could shove it down any local jurisdiction's throat. So it is an uphill battle to speak truth to power in your community. Um, this is the, uh, one of the slides that I like to show people. And one of the reasons is because it's got two red stars. And if you review the proposed health protections that are being offered at this point, you'll find one startling thing, particularly from the point of view of the second red star up here, is that the health protections that are being offered in the plan to the people that live down here in Delta are much, much greater than the health protections that you'll be offered. In the Delta area, they're gonna bring, uh, they're, they're gonna put an additional coating of, of uh, material to keep the coal from blowing out of the train cars, uh, two instead of one. Um, they're gonna bring them into a sealed building that probably will have negative air pressure so that the dust can't get out of it. They will not be allowed to store it outside at all. That, that isn't going to be the situation where you're, you're at. <laughs> uh, rather dramatically different. Um, the other reason I put it up is that um, 
one of the major concerns I have is in, is in health. Now, I'm just going to talk about health tonight. That's all I'm going to talk about, except at the very end, I'm going to mention some other concerns that I have. I'm not an expert at those things, though. But I can tell you that one of the other concerns I have is the safety of the ships that come in and out. I think there are marine impacts that are potentially very, very serious. And I don't know as much as I should know about that, but I do want to mention some things at the end. And suffice to say, this kind of transshipment, kind of bringing it in on, on trains and loading on barges and then stockpiling and rolling on ships and taking it out, that's a lot of handling of, of the product. Um, it's, a, it's actually a much bigger picture than just that, though. It actually starts in Wyoming, uh, primarily a little bit in Montana, comes across on the train all the way down the Columbia River. These trains are so heavy they can't actually go over the Cascade Mountains. They're not capable of that. They're about two and a half kilometers long. If they lock up all the brakes on them, it takes them about, uh, you know, a, about a kilometer and a half to stop. Um, so there are some safety issues that, that people that are facing the train issue face that you won't have to face. A, a woman just a few weeks ago was killed in, uh, in White Rock by a train. These things are, it's not that the engineer wouldn't love to stop them if some child or young person or in, an elder were in the track, it's that they can't. Um, so in some ways, you've, you've gotten out of that, that leg of it. Uh, but unfortunately, you are on the, on the other side of it. The rest of the picture uh, is that it's not just doesn't stop there. This stuff is hauled across the sea and goes to uh, uh, primarily to China, uh, but to some extent also to Korea and possibly to India. Um, and the health impacts there are very great. And I think they're things that you uh, should at least know about. I think responsible people uh, want to be aware of the implications of what happens. Um, my, uh, I, and I know a bit about this because my wife is Chinese and uh, she, over the last few months, has spent some time in China because her uh, aunt had stomach cancer and had to have her stomach removed and her uncle had laryngeal cancer and had to have a trach put in and a feeding tube put in because he could no longer either breathe or swallow and her other uncle had a stroke and died all within a few months. Now, what's going on in China is, uh, this is a picture that she took. Um, the air pollution levels, if they get to 100 here, people are supposed to go inside and lay down. <laughs> you know, if you've, got, if you've got asthma or if you've got uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, you shouldn't be outside. Kids shouldn't be outside playing. In China, routinely the air pollution levels, for example, in Beijing, get to, to 300. Uh, recently they went to 700 and they peaked at 900. And honestly, that, those levels are incompatible with life. Um, Everybody in the world's, our life expectancy increases every year, as bad as we think it all is, our, we all live longer every year. Uh, and the only exception to that is where there are wars, and wars wreak havoc with that, but barring wars, nobody lives a shorter lifespan, except in China in the past few years. And in fact, there's a measurable decline in southern China of five and a half years in life expectancy. Um, and the reason is, I think very clearly, the air pollution. Air pollution has not been categorized as a carcinogen ever until uh, about three days ago, when the World Health Organization concluded a very long multi-year study and concluded that it is a class one carcinogen. Uh, the, uh, so that's the situation in China. It's not your problem. There is one way in which it is your problem. Uh, the water that I drink every day from Lake Whatcom, that's our reservoir uh, that I drink and my kids drink and my wife drinks and uh, 90,000 other people in town drink, comes from Lake Whatcom. Uh, Lake Whatcom also has fish in it. And the fish have been studied and there's enough mercury in the fish that women of childbearing age and children are not allowed to eat the fish that come out of the lake. And when they looked at where does that mercury come from, because if you find that kind of problem, you want to fix it, right? <laughs> um, they found that 15 to 30 percent of the depositional mercury in Lake Whatcom comes from Chinese coal-fired power plants. And when they look broader in Oregon and California, and I'm sure it will be true here in BC, about 20 percent of the depositional mercury comes from Chinese coal-fired power plants. That sounds extraordinary. The rest of it, though, you need to remember there are 1.3 billion people in China and that they build a new coal-fired power plant every week. Okay. So the reason we're shipping coal there, and, and th this isn't your problem, this is our America's problem, is that we do some very stupid things. Um, and most notably, we, uh, we socialize costs and privatize profit. It's, a, it's an old system in America. <laughs> um, 
And so why would they be digging up rocks and shipping them to China? You ever think about that? Does that seem sort of implausible? So it turns out that the coal that's being shipped there is owned not by private corporations, but by the United States government. So this coal is all government coal. And it is sold at auction, typically with only one bidder. And typically they pay around a dollar a ton. A high-priced coal would be $11 a ton. And they're able to sell it in China for $125 a ton. And the expected uh, profit is, is measured in billions of dollars. Okay? Because our government is stupid enough to sell it at the prices that they do. Those of you that are farmers know that good topsoil costs a lot more than $11 a ton. <laughs> Uh, a lot more. So this is an unusual and I think actually a, a twisted and, uh, and distorted economic situation that allows this to happen at all. And again, that's not your fault. It's my job to fix that, not yours. And I'm working on it. Um, to, uh, I guess, to, uh, the other introductory comment I'd like to make is that doctors are very reluctant to speak out about things. We do not like conflict as a group. We certainly don't like being in the middle of, of uh, controversial issues. Um, so when he said 200 doctors in my community all support a single thing, I got to tell you, I've never seen 200 doctors agree about anything in my community. And let me just tell you a brief story about how and why that happened. Um, the, uh, a woman named Sarah Mostad reached out to our medical community, sent an email to a couple dozen of us, and, and it said, yeah, I heard about this, this Coal, coal export business, and they're going to, the one in our community isn't like yours. This is about 8 million tons at max. Um, the one in my community would be about 50 million tons, which would be a train every hour, 24 hours a day, um, you know, two and a half kilometers long. So Sarah was worried about that, and, and the thing you need to know about Sarah Mostad is she's a mom of three kids. She's still nursing one of them, and she's a lovely person, but more importantly, she has a PhD in epidemiology and an MD degree from Harvard. And she's the person that if my child was critically ill with infectious disease, I would insist that Sarah Mostad take care of my son. Okay? And so would all of you, and so would every doctor in my community. So when that person reached out to us, somebody that is unequivocally more, more intelligent than any of the rest of us, <laughs> very clearly, um, and said this might be a problem, a broad array of people responded. And that was the strength of our group and remains the strength of our group. Because uh, pro-business doctors came, uh, and environmental doctors came, uh, socially active doctors came, and doctors that have never said a word in public came. Uh, Republicans came and Democrats came, our conservatives and liberals. Um, and about a dozen of us became about a dozen of us became the core group. Um, and what I can tell you is that we did something that that. Uh, that doctors, many of our docs in our core group have PhDs in addition to MD degrees. And so what did we do? We studied the issue. <laughs> um, <clears throat> we went to the librarian and we said, B, we want all the articles about the possible impacts of transporting and storing coal. Get them for us. And so she came up with about 400 articles. And we went through those articles one at a time. Now, we're all extremely busy people. Um, up until fairly recently, I had six scheduled days of work a week. And that's not untypical for the group that came up, uh, came together. And so we got together exactly twice in a year and a half. But what we did do was every night from about 9 till about 1 or 2 in the morning, we would sit down at the computer and we would read those articles. We would summarize them and we'd send those summaries to each other for critical review. Now, these aren't articles in the New York Times. These are or some magazine. These are articles published in medical journals that are peer-reviewed. That's one of the standards. Unless they were published in a peer-reviewed journal, we didn't even look at it. And initially, we thought we'd find some in favor and some against. And what we found over the course of our review, that they all ended up in the same pile. They all said, there are potential serious issues here. Um, some of the things we encountered that were quite interesting was that uh, one of our doctors just came unglued one day, in fact, because he discovered that after reviewing this long article that clearly established a threshold of harm from uh, a pollutant, he discovered that the standard for protecting us uh, was well uh, below that amount. And he just said, how, how can that be? 
You know, he'd never been involved in the political reality of knowing that those are political decisions. They're not scientific decisions. And what that standard is may not protect the people that are exposed to it. We actually encountered that a number of times in our reviews where the, the federal standard was not protective uh, based on the scientific review of the literature. Um, so as we move forward in this review, um, about five issues emerged, and I'll, and I'll go into detail in a bit about what those five issues were, and they're issues that I think you need to be concerned about as well. Um, the first thing we did was we reviewed some overview articles. There were two articles published in the United States that were kind of very large reviews. They're review articles, and they take all the literature up to that point in time and review it. And one was by the American Lung Association, the other was by the American Heart Association, and the references are here. And Particularly if you don't agree with what I have to say, I'd love for you to look at these and read them. Because if there's something wrong with these, I'd like you to tell me. I would love to quit doing what I'm doing. So if you disagree, please do that and please let me know. Because I'm ready to stop. It's taking up too much time. Um, but do look at them. That's what we did. And what we found was that, for example, in the Lung Association article, uh, the, the data showed that there's an increased risk of death from respiratory and cardiovascular causes, uh, including strokes and lung cancer increased mortality in infants and young children, increased number of uh, heart attacks, especially among the elderly, inflammation in young lungs, uh, increased hospitalization of cardiovascular disease, including strokes and of heart failure, increased emergency room visits for patients suffering acute respiratory ailments, increased hospitalization for asthma among children, and increased severity of asthma attacks for kids from the kind of pollution that would come from the trains and trucks and boats. Um, and we read that and that kind of got our attention. You know, Sarah's intuition had some substance to it. So then we began to not just look at the review articles, because that required somebody else screening it to say it was good. We actually went back and began to look at the actual articles. Um, and the New England Journal of Medicine is the most prestigious uh, journal in medicine in the world. And we started with some of those. Pretty, pretty careful analysis goes into reviewing them. Uh, this first was one of the first one we looked at, and it showed that an increased exposure to a particulate matter that was 2.5 microns in size was associated with incre decreased lung function in, in developing children. Um, so diesel particulate matter is what comes out of every diesel motor when it uh, combusts and there's a core carbon fragment in the middle and the heavy metals and the toxins attached to that. But the particle, that 2.5 microns, turns out to be a big deal. So a 10 micron particle, like typical dust that blows around, gets, gets filtered out in your upper airways. Um, these really small particles make it all the way down through your airways and below the cilia and into your alveoli. And take that package of metals and toxins right up against your capillaries and deposits them where they're absorbed into your bloodstream. We now know, and, and we've actually had people come up and do continuing medical education lectures about how that works. They know at the microbiological and molecular level exactly how it works and exactly how it causes heart attacks and strokes. It causes the plaques in the blood vessel to release from the wall and plug the vessel. And that's where the strokes and the heart attacks come from. It's understood in excruciating detail at this point. So we began to go through more articles. Here was another one we looked at that looked at the uh, diesel exhaust caused by uh, decrease in oxygen in heart muscle and increased tendency um, to form clots. Uh, so we went through that and then we began to go through more articles. Here's another one from the New England Journal. Here's another one um, that we looked at. Here's one, uh, uh, another one from the New England Journal. So we looked after article, 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 after article. And uh, so we began to realize that, that there were some serious issues. Um, and to summarize those articles, and, and those are all on a website, so uh, coltrainfacts.org. If you want to go look at the articles and our summaries, go to coltrainfacts.org, and they're there. And I would encourage any of you that are concerned about this to do that. Because I think what you'll find, you'll be overwhelmed in the same way we were overwhelmed. Uh, you know, to have a sustained effort over several years by several hundred people is a big deal. People that are very busy. But when you read that literature, you don't have a choice. Now the other thing we did at that point was we said, this is a serious deal and we're people who've 
purpose in life is to relieve suffering and save lives. That's, that's what I do for a living. Okay? And that's what all these guys do for a living. And we said, we're not going to just push this out of our community. We committed first to pushing it out of our community. And then we said, we can't just do that. And so starting from two years ago, we sent all the findings we have to the health departments from Wyoming to BC. Now, some of you may know that the jurisdictional health officers in British Columbia have called for the same thing we're calling for, which is an objective, independent health risk assessment of, of these risks. So uh, Kendall Perry has asked for it, the provincial health officer. The health officer in, in uh, uh, both the jurisdictional health officers in, in, in the lower mainland and the health officer for here as well recently wrote a letter that said to, to the jurisdictional authorities and said, you have to do that study. To date, the, the port is unwilling to do that. Now, that's everybody, okay? But the point is primarily, we didn't want to just shove it out. And the reason I'm taking my time to come here to talk with you, I'm not Canadian, you know, it's a nice place, but I'd rather be home with my family, uh, is because I think there's potentially significant suffering and death because of this activity, and you need to know about it. Now, it's going to, when I leave, it's going to be your job to do something about it. It's not my job. My job is to come here and educate you. Um, so what we found was that air and water pollutants from both coal dust and diesel exhaust were significant issues. We also found that increased train traffic had additional uh, impacts and train and boat traffic from noise, from delays at rail crossings, and, and, and also from safety uh, point of view for trains and ships as well. And we, that's based on a review of the literature. That's not our opinion. There's a, there's a literature about all those things suggests that there's significant problems there. Um, the uh, coal has many forms, and, and coal is a pretty inert thing, really. Uh, a gentleman before the meeting brought me this just now. He just handed it to me, and I, I want to thank him again. Uh, this came off the bottom of the bay. A diver found this chunk of coal and brought it up, and it's obviously had been there for a bit. And they've been shipping coal out here for 20 years in small amounts, and this is one of them that didn't make it. This isn't supposed to end up in the bay. It's against the rules for this to end up in the bay, but that's, that's not a particle. That's a pretty good-sized rock. Um, now, coal has a lot of things in it. Coal has uh, any number of things which aren't very nice. Some have uranium in them, depending on exactly where you get it. They all have lead. They all have mercury. They all have cadmium. You know, there's things in here you probably wouldn't want in your water supply, and you probably wouldn't want in the fish that you eat or the shellfish that you might harvest. Um, so it's air and water pollution. It's both from the coal dust itself and it's from the diesel exhaust. Now, again, I said I wasn't going to talk about environmental stuff, but one of the significant impacts in our community is that uh, where they load and unload this stuff, there is likely to be a lot of coal dust go off in the immediate area, and there are herring there. And the coal dust is likely not through any chemical contamination, but just physically landing on the eelgrass on the bottom of the bay will prevent light from getting to it and is likely to kill the eelgrass. Well, it turns out that the eelgrass are essential for the herring to lay their eggs, and that the herring are essential for the salmon, and the salmon are essential for the orcas. So there can be substantial uh, impacts. If anybody's interested in that, I actually have the slides of herring counts in our community just south of where West Shore Terminal is. And you will see every decade a dramatic decrease in the amount, number of herring that are there. Now there may have been other reasons as well for that decrease, but it <coughs> geographically is, appears to be impacted by the West Shore uh, facility. Coal dust goes five to eight kilometers, typically. In a big wind event, it can go further. Um, so there are a bunch of things here, and I want to go through them in a little more detail with you. In, in a nutshell, the primary organ systems are respiratory, cardiovascular, and neurologic. Um, and there are a few issues that we found across all these articles. Um, the proximity to a vulnerable population is a big deal. It matters whether or not you live upwind or downwind from that coal pile. <laughs> um, and so if it's an onshore wind and, and those, those barges are coming up by where you live and it blows onshore, that's a significant <coughs> issue. If the diesel from the trucks and the vehicles that manage it on site or the ships going up and down blows it towards where you're living, that's a much bigger deal. Um, so proximity makes a difference. Um, there are many other uh, aspects of it. It turns out that not everybody's impacted equally. 
that in fact all the literature we looked at suggested that children would be impacted more than adults, that elderly would be impacted more than those of other ages other than children, that those with pre-existing lung conditions were more likely to be impacted, that those with heart disease were more likely to be impacted, that diabetics were, and for some reason I don't understand women over 50 were disproportionately impacted in many of these studies. And that of course workers exposed to these things uh, uh, also, uh, both, both the coal dust and the diesel exhaust, had increased risks and because they're very close to, to the source. Um, now there aren't any kids here, they're mostly gray-haired people here. Um, so many of you may, may have adult kids but not little kids, but one of the things one of the speakers that I've been a speaker with in the past, Stephen Gilbert, is a, is a toxicologist and deals with kids a lot. He his practices at Children's Hospital. And he, this is his, his slide and his quote, children are not little adults. They eat more, they breathe more, they drink more per body weight than adults do. And the impacts of health-related exposures are greater than, on them than they are on adults. And that certainly was borne out in the literature that we reviewed. Um, so just to go through it, Coal dust is known to, prove, provide, to cause chronic bronchitis, emphysema, pulmonary fibrosis, and environmental contamination through leaching of the toxic and heavy metals into the water supply. Those are, those are facts. Um, there can be environmental contamination from coming off trains and boats or from stockpiles. They have mercury, they have lead, they have chromium, they've got other things in them as well. But that environmental contamination certainly can and, and likely would take place. Um, Coal dust contains also lead and mercury. Uh, it blows off the piles. Um, sprays uh, or water decrease that some, but are not fully effective. Uh, they might even decrease by 85%, but the, even with the best treatment, it's still about 15% of the fugitive coal dust gets off-site. Um, diesel particulate matter is probably the most worrisome thing to me. That's the stuff that comes out of the stack of the ship. That's the stuff that comes out of the equipment that handles it. Uh, it's been shown to impair pulmonary development in kids. It's been shown to increase uh, heart disease from all causes, uh, measurable pulmonary inflammation, increased severity and frequency of asthma attacks, ER visits and hospital admissions in children, uh, increased rates of myocardial infarction in adults, and increased risk of cancer. Um, now I talked a little bit about this, but basically diesel particulate matter is these little tiny particles, about 2.5 microns, they attach the, the uh, toxic substances and metals, other things, to a carbon core after they're combusted. In the United States, we passed a law some time ago, and for two years, no truck or car that's diesel is allowed to put out any partic diesel particulate matter. Zero. That's technically possible. And it's true for any vehicle sold in the United States for the past two years. Trains and ships were exempted. Um, uh, so asthma, cancer, heart attacks are all clearly linked to that kind of pollution. Noise exposure, the thing, when this came up, I told the guy that brought it up he was nuts, that we shouldn't do that, everybody would laugh, uh, it would undercut our credibility. But since we were a science-based group, he came back with articles. He came back with article after article. And it turns out that noise is a big deal. That if elders are woken up every two hours at night, they're incre they have an increased risk of, heart, uh, of cardiac arrhythmias, it turns out they have an increased risk of depression. It turns out that uh, kids that are um, exposed to noise, for example, during the workday in schools, children are especially vulnerable and they sub suffer cognitive impairment because of that chronic noise exposure. Now, you guys don't have trains here, but here is a picture of the schools in the region of the Fraser Street Docks. Every gray spot here, 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 there, there are all schools uh, very near the tracks. Um, probably not a wise idea. Um, the other issues that we became concerned about, and, and this is true for both ships and, and, and cranes, uh, is there are safety issues. The, the ships that they want to bring here to, to pick this stuff up are the largest things that human beings have ever made that move. They have an incredibly poor safety record. Uh, as some of you know, fairly recently one of them ran through the West Shore Dock, uh, destroying it. Um, they, have, they are single hold. They have hundreds of thousands of gallons of diesel fuel in them. Maybe not what you want in your waters around here. They destroy fishing nets. They, 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 you know, they, 
And if, if you, just like with the trains, if the, the, the captain wants to stop if something's in the way, but you can't. Um, the trains, which is, again, not your real issue, but the trains, you know, typically delay traffic for eight to ten minutes. Um, in my hospital, we work really hard to shave 45 seconds off of a response from when somebody hits the door till they're on pump or till they're getting the stroke therapy. 45 seconds. We work hard to do that. And it makes a measurable difference in outcome. To add eight to ten minutes to that time response it puts us back 20 years in terms of treating strokes or heart attacks. Um, when when the, you know, some of our cardiovascular surgeons weren't real keen on what we were doing, and when they really sunk in, they signed on too. Um, there are major studies that we said, look at these. These have all been published in major journals, and I would invite any of you that care about this to look at that literature. It is sobering. Um, uh, the transportation, storage, and combustion of coal all lead to significant problems, every aspect of that. Noise is a big deal. Frequent long trains are, are, are a big deal. So what to do about it? We looked around and said, what tools do we have to address these issues? And there's something, there's a process which for several years over the past decade has been developed called the health impact assessment process. And it's something where you simply take all the data, like the data we've generated, and then you apply it to a particular population. You figure out what are the actual risks? How many people? What ages? What locations? What genders? Who will be impacted by this? And what we've asked for from the beginning, and what all of your jurisdiction health officers here in BC have asked for, is to have a study like that done of this process before it takes place. Not after. Now, what the proponents of this decided to do, they said, okay, we're going to do an environmental impact assessment. We're going to look at coal dust because they thought they could mitigate that. And we're going to do it in two weeks. Time's almost up. I expect they'll put it out. They hired a corporation, which is their long-term partner, to do that study. Not exactly objective and independent. They don't want to look at any issues except coal dust, and they've already... Uh, they, they believe they can mitigate the coal dust issue in the urban area down there. They haven't talked about the coal dust issue up here at all. And if you let them, they won't talk about it. Um, there has to be properly done health impact assessment. It's my assessment that that would take 18 months. The jurisdiction health officer here in BC has said that it will take between 6 and 12 months. But it will not take two weeks. You can, you can hire some PR folks and snow people in two weeks. You cannot do a meaningful study. Um, now, just a, a few things that I'm not an expert at, so forgive me. Just indulge me for one more minute, okay? There's just things that I've found out that I want to share with you that, that are worrisome to me. I'm not an expert at it. This is the biggest ferry in our fleet in Washington. You guys have some bigger ferries, but, but not much bigger. That's the biggest ferry we've got. This is a proportional scale of how big the ships are that carry coal. Single hold, hundreds of thousands of gallons of fuel, worst safety record, they are massive. They also pump out bilges. Now, coming over here, there was a fellow on the ferry who's an engineer. And he, I was with some reluctance when he came over to talk to me and asked me what I was, why I was visiting. I, I didn't really want to tell him what I was doing because I know it's a little controversial here on the island. And when he finally found out what I was doing, because I told him, you know, no reason not to be honest and out, out there, he told me two stories. He said that, you know, he used to work on the ferries down by Tawasin. And the air filters here, when he takes them out and cleans them, he bangs them on the floor and he puts them back in. The filters from down by Tawasin, he throws away because they're caked with, with black coal dust. The second thing he told me was that he lives here and that, in fact, a bunch of the oysters have been impacted here. That the oysters, in fact, there are big sections of them that are dying because there's a parasitic muscle that came in from Asia and now is impacting the, the oysters here. Now, they're supposed to pump out those bilges 200 miles offshore, <laughs> okay, uh, and, and put in clean, presumably. 
You certainly can't float one of those ships in here without ballast in it because they get blown off course. You can't do it. Um, so there are issues about that marine impact that need to be looked at. Here's the West Shore crash where it went right through their own dock. They'll tell you these are really safe. Problems don't happen. Here's a, a, a recent uh, crash of a, of a large bulk <coughs> carrying ship uh, that, that broke in half. Here's another one. Here's a picture of the West Shore facility on a windy day. Um, how, now to prevent this blowing away, what they use, they spray water on it. The, the coal dust handling facility at, at, in Bellingham, how much water will come out of the Nooksack River? One, over one billion gallons a year. Now it's a river that already is flowing below in stream minimum flow, which means the amount to keep it biologically alive so that the threatened and endangered species in it can still get up river. And they're gonna take a billion gallons a year to spray it on coal. Where does it go? Is it contained and recycled? And No, it goes right in the ground. Um, one of the first talks I gave here was second or third talk I gave up in Canada. A, a gentleman came forward named Phil, and Phil gave a talk with me. And I was pretty uncomfortable with that because I didn't know Phil. But it turns out Phil is an inspector in Prince Rupert that inspects the coal facility there. And he brought a whole bunch of pictures, more of which I'd love to show you, but I uh, don't have time. But there are pictures of how carefully the facility up there is run, and the answer is not carefully. That's all coal on the water. And it sinks down to the bottom and covers the bottom just like the chunk that the fellow brought me here. Um, he's an interesting guy to talk to. I'd encourage you to have him up. Um, the other thing is these are massive ships that make a lot of noise, and underwater noise pollution is a big deal for every, but particularly marine mammals. It's a big deal. They get confused, they get disoriented, and they leave. Uh, somebody told me about the seals that used to be here, that they're basically all gone uh, already. Um, there are some proposed expansions. You know, this is not the only facility. Um, Oregon, Washington, and a number of expansions here in BC as well. So it's, if they do a health impact assessment, it should be for the cumulative impacts of all of these things together, not just one piece at a time. Because you won't know the real impact if you do one piece at a time. You can see there are literally uh, four different projects here, 8 million tons, 6 million tons, a million tons, 13 million tons. There are substantial other projects going on in your region. Um, so I'll just, uh, I'll stop there and let you ask questions. There are other issues. We can talk about economics and finances and jobs and all that. But honestly, I think it's better just to talk about what you've heard. So people look a little sober. Um, I, I, I would appreciate if you ask me the hardest questions you can, because I came a long way to answer hard questions. I don't want to be told I'm a nice guy. I want hard questions. So the hardest questions you got, let's have it. Okay, I got a question. Yes, sir. On your moderator, hang on a second. Now, I'm your moderator here. Um, so, we'll try and run this for about 45 minutes. Um, so, would you please try and use a mic when you come up? Can you come up in a line here to ask questions? And can you keep your questions as concise as possible? Because everybody, if you want everybody to be involved, you can. Um, as as Bell says, please use it. Use the door on the rear. Now I'm going to ask the first question, Tom, because that's my privilege. But do stay here and stay, stay in line so that then we know who's next. <coughs> Otherwise, then you will come around with the mic and you can actually ask the question sitting down. Well, would you please say your name? And my name is Richard Fletcher. This is the first question. Um, Dr. James, you said um, the words I picked out was increased suffering and death as a result of COVID. And you said that the uh, dust could travel between five and eight kilometers. Now, Gibbs Bay will be, is about four kilometers away, and we get winds of up to 20, 30 um, kilometers more, and particularly we get a prevailing uh, northwesterly in the summer. Now, the question then is as familiar as you are with the facility that will be up there, um, how confident are you that these situation can be mitigated as the uh, 
regional district director so feel confident that it can be, or is it re really an either or situation? Well, <clears throat> I guess I'll be honest and tell you that I don't know the answer to that question. And what has to, a health impact assessment would answer your question fairly, objectively, and with confidence. That kind of modeling has to be done with more knowledge than we have on the table. You have to know where the winds are blowing all the time. You have to know what control methods they're going to use. It's going to take a lot more information to answer that, that question accurately. So the fact that people are telling you that they, the one thing I can tell you is the people that tell you that they know that it's not a problem shouldn't have the confidence that they have. Because I know that you can't answer that question without knowing a lot more information than's on the table right now. So to answer it, you have to have a health impact assessment that includes modeling, real modeling. It takes time. You've got to get all the data that's there. You have to know exactly what kind of dust suppression they're going to have to have. And, and then you can make a determination about that. What I can tell you is that the West Shore system had a pretty good system. And you saw the picture of what happened there on a day when things didn't work like it was supposed to. And they had about that amount of wind. Um, you can also, I'd be happy to show you what happened to the, to the herring in, on our side of the border directly south of it. They all went away. Um, so uh, it, it t I can't answer it. I wish I could. I can't. You'll have to do the kind of modeling and the kind of study that would actually answer it. But I would be, I would ask the people that, that believe that they have a confident answer, I'd, I'd ask them what that answer is based on. Yes, sir. My name is Tom Reed. I live here on Texada. I have a slow farm. We're a few miles, not use miles because I'm an immigrant. And I can't remember kilometers for miles sometimes. I live about three miles to the north east of, of the quarry, and I'm a strong supporter of the mining industry on Texada. I have been for many years, but I am not wild about there being coal dust on our property and the crops that we grow at our farm. And so I took an interest in this from a defensive point of view. And I wrote a letter to Lafarge and I asked, um, what are you going to do to monitor this in the community? And if there's a problem, what are you going to do about that? So there was no answer to that letter. I wrote the same basic questions to the regional district. There was no answer. They, in fact, referred me back to Lafarge. So getting no answers from them, I went to the BC government to a man named Ed Ty, who is oh, an inspector. I'm going to get to yeah. my question. Mr. Ty told me he works for Ministry of Energy and Mines, and he's a, one of the people in charge of Lafarge's application, about reviewing it. And I asked him the question, because he's worked for coal mines for many years. And he said, and I want you to tell me a little if you can about this, that there's a thing called a dose meter that you can put up at your anywhere in your community, and that every so often you take uh, something, a slide or whatever from that, and you send it to an independent laboratory and they tell you if there's any coal dust and what size it is. And he pointed out it can be, it's not visible to the human eye, which goes along with what you're saying. Right. So I want to know from you what effect it means citizens have to monitor this kind of thing if it does get approved and how can we know the truth by, by monitoring. Well, thank you for your question, Tom. Uh, what I can tell you is that... I hope that's hard enough question. Yeah, it is. Um, the, uh, the, what I know about it is, is, for example, the industry in our community. Uh, Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railway has data from those very monitors you're talking about. and has had that data for a number of years, and they won't release any of it. It is private, confidential information that they will not share with anybody. And that's the situation that leaves me uncomfortable. Even, even I got sent a copy of the handout that, that Lafarge gave out at the, at the meeting they had here. And did anybody else get that? It's really interesting because on the top of it, on, of every page, it says you are not allowed to disclose this to anybody else. It's really interesting. <laughs> um, uh, so yes, there are those meters. Yes, you can maintain them. Yes, it is expensive. There's a recent study done by an, an atmospheric scientist specialist named Dan Jaffe down in our area. He's going to publish the results uh, fairly soon. That will give you some idea about how far away from these sources, that, what concentrations would be. Uh, he uh, raised the money to do that. It was about $18,000 to do the one set of testing. Uh, so that, I know the answer to that. It was about $18,000 to do the, that particular set of tests that he did that he'll be publishing fairly soon. He believes that it's going to take a much bigger study than that to actually know. 
for certain what the deal is, but he, he, he was able to bring together those $18,000 and get the initial study done. It would be, in my judgment, probably prohibitively expensive for an individual to do that relative to what benefit you would have as an individual farmer. As a community, though, I think if you're worried about that, you should ask your elected officials to demand that that be done for you. That isn't an individual person's responsibility. Moreover, depending on where the prevailing winds are, it may be a big deal for you and it may not be for the person next door. It shouldn't be that citizens are burdened with proving that somebody's causing a significant problem. There ought to be a process that models that to start with and gives you the information up front. Uh, Bob Chips. Uh, uh, my question is, uh, is there any kind of uh, delegation or anything or, or people that are actually educating the Chinese? I'm surprised they're not educated enough about it now with all the social media, but educating them to not use the coal. Like they have been, uh, back in the 50s in Britain, they probably had the uh, brownouts and the toxic uh, air. That's well, a good question. Um, the, uh, what I can tell you is the way that all of this came about in terms of understanding that, that these kind of, uh, uh, this kind of pollution causes a problem is actually from London because they had a big air inversion and a thousand people died in a matter of a few days from heart attacks uh, primarily. And somebody noticed the correlation between that temperature inversion and the deaths that occurred. Now, the Chinese, uh, I, I've been to China, I go to China every year, my, uh, half of my family lives in China. Uh, they are very well aware of the consequences and impacts of this pollution, okay? They all know about it. Their government, you think our, we can think our government is bad? <laughs> uh, there, was a, there was a news article on just today on the radio when I was driving up that about what happens if you blog and you are considered to have put a rumor out in blogging, they come to your door and arrest you. Um, and, and a rumor is pretty subjectively defined. So it, it's pretty hard to make social change of any kind in China. I know that the, the official leaders there know it's a problem. My, my wife's uncle is one of the officials that helped, two of, she's from Hong Kong, but two of her, two of her aunts and an aunt and an uncle both went to be part of the revolution. And he was a major planner in Shenzhen, in the southern part of China, where the pollution is the worst, where the economic development has taken place. I've been there, I've talked to him in Chinese and English both, and what I know, they know the jig is up. They don't know how to get out of it. They are currently investing more money in wind and solar than anybody else on the planet. They are putting in more wind and solar than anybody else on the planet. They are in the process of trying to switch as quickly as they can the coal plants that they have to uh, uh, natural gas rather than coal. Um, I mean, they know it's a problem and they're working on it. Uh, they also know that electric, things like electric cars. My, I just read a, a paper by my 16-year-old nephew from China, and he's a very smart kid, and he was modeling how much uh, increased pollution there would be because of the use of electric cars. And he was smart enough to plug it back into the coal-fired power plants that generate electricity and counting that as pollution. So he's a 16-year-old kid, and he's a smart one. Uh, he takes the SATs every six months and gets 800 and everything. That's what they do there. That's their, that's their MO. But he's figuring that stuff out. And if, if a 16-year-old kid is, in 1.3 billion people, there are plenty of smart people figuring it out. What they're looking for is a way to, to continue to grow the way they are and not kill themselves. It's not different than what we're doing. I mean, all of you know the jig is up, right? I mean, the, the level of pollution that is impacting our lives is significant and it's going to get more significant. And I don't want to talk about climate change and all that stuff, but the ocean is becoming more acidic, the temperature is going up, sea levels are rising. Those are all realities. That's not an opinion. That's just happening. And unless we change the way we're living significantly, it's going to continue to be a big problem. It ain't just China. I mean, the biggest polluter on the planet isn't China. It's America. And it's because of how we live our lives. And we need to change, or ma nature isn't going to be kind. That's already very clear. Not a lighthearted answer, sorry. Yes, 
from somebody uh, on the internet. Oh, super. Wow, technology works. Uh, Summer in the Lower Mainland. Uh, so uh, what is the significance of uh, WHO's report in relation to uh, Texada coal and dust in the Strait of Georgia? Oh. So the, the, what's happened with the WHO is that they have, for the first time, you know, what you just did may be one of the solutions for us. The fact that people can participate in this that didn't have to drive here, is that cool or what? Um, I mean, that, that's, that's a solution. We've got to find as many as we can. The WHO report is significant in that what it says is that, is that air pollution, the kind of things we've been talking about, is a class one carcinogen. Now, that's never been asserted before, and, and now it's not only asserted but proven. Um, that means that, you know, you guys have really clean air up here compared to a lot of places, right? There aren't very many people, there's not a lot of industry. But your industry per person is probably a lot denser than almost any place I've been because you got a, for, for, a, for an island. And as you know, and I was shocked to find out, Texada has kind of been gerrymandered. It is the one place where you can do almost anything from an industrial point of view. And the other islands all have much more stringent protections than you do. I mean, and, and, that, and I don't think you have to just accept that. I mean, you, you, pe people have been here for four generations, for God's sakes. Um, I think people need to say, yeah, we're willing to have industry, but that industry has got to do it in a way that is safe for us and our children and our grandchildren. So I think WHO has, I think, in a very timely way, this just happened on the 17th, uh, you know, confirmed that these kinds of pollution are significant. And I think it's yet one more uh, standard that has to be met by industry. Uh, jobs are great. Let's have jobs. Let's have all the jobs we can have. But let's not pay the price in people's lives and health for those jobs. Socializing that cost and privatizing that profit ain't okay. Uh, I have a few things that I'd like to uh, ask you about. Um, one of them is... What was your name, sir? Uh, Lars Hawks is my name. And I Thank live, you, Lars. I uh, over on the mainland, uh, down by Lag Bay. And uh, I am concerned about the, uh, the coal dust actually reaching our area. It might be sort of on the border of, of, of where it would, it would fall in the water rather than heat us. But I grew up in Norway, and uh, I can remember on a really ideal windy situation, we, we, we got uh, a lot of, and, and it could be possibly acid rain and coal dust, I mean, but things got really dirty once in a while, and it came all the way from Germany and got right up to Oslo, and that's a huge distance. So I'm not quite sure, uh, you know, what, uh, how far this coal dust really will go. The other thing, too, is um, uh, in terms of covering this coal dust, uh, I mean, you look at pictures of the barges, there doesn't seem to be any actual cover on top of them. Now, they say they're going to spray something on top to, to mitigate it from ground, but uh, at what wind velocity does this thing hold up? I mean, has there been any research on that at all? Um, let, me, let me just take that one first, and, and then we can do another one in a second. So, uh, it's interesting because the and it's hard to know, the standards you have in Canada in place for your coal, for, for the metallurgical coal, are quite different than the stuff for the, for the stuff from Powder River Basin. And the coals are quite different. So just to, let me just have a minute about that. The coal cars that are Canadian are all loaded so that the top of the coal is below the top of the car. The coal cars that come from America are piled high into the air on, by design. Um, so there's a difference in how they're handled. The coal that is shipped through Canada already has two sprains at the beginning and part way through, even the short trip they make from the other side of BC to here. The ones from the States get sprayed in Wyoming and never get sprayed again, okay? So there are some things there. In terms of how it will be handled on barges, what I can tell you is that no one knows, because to my knowledge, it's never been done. So it's an experiment. It would be nice to have the results of data before you make a decision. They're going to talk to some engineers and make some stuff up. 
on slavery. And it would be great to have actual data about that, to, to be sure. Um, the, the situation you described almost certainly was not coal dust. Now, other things like mercury comes here from China, and acid rain certainly happens and affects places very far away. So there are distant impacts from things that they do. I sincerely believe that rarely dust may come further than five to eight kilometers, but I don't think it's going to go significantly going to do that. I'd have to say I just don't think that's realistic. Five to eight kilometers? Could. Uh, further, I don't think so. Yeah? Another question? Um, I find it rather ironic that, you know, we've been exploring all of our rivers for these independent power projects, run of river projects, and so on, to produce green energy. And then, uh, you know, we seem to be proud of that, although those things are very questionable and <coughs> electric prices enormously. But then we just go ahead and, and forget about all this green stuff and just import that these big piles of coal sit right at Texada. And uh, at the same time, we ask kids, when we go into a store, and you buy cigarettes, we have to cover up the cigarettes. <laughs> these coal dust piles, they're not covered at all. But interestingly, the public relations firms uh, that are being used by the coal industry, like in the United States, it's Edwin, the largest coal relations firm in the world. And they're the same public relations firm that managed tobacco. Because they, they're well practiced at this, at selling you things that you don't necessarily want. I got an email the other day from the Coal Alliance, and it's a very interesting email. I've spoken out maybe eight or ten times now in Canada. And uh, I, was, I was very. Uh, uh, pleased that they had noticed uh, because I got an email and my employer was sending an email asking for copies of the materials I've been shooting. And I think a very clear effort to intimidate. Uh, so uh, they are paying attention. They do have great public relations people. But it's interesting that a person would call and ask for technical information. And I checked this guy out. You, know, you can't hide on the internet. And, and I think he actually came to the last talk I gave. I should have not confronted him, but chatted with him. I think very interesting. But he's a, he's a guy that worked for the uh, CDC, uh, has got some awards, and now is a paid public relations guy. But I love to talk to a scientist. I, I'm not very interested in talking to a public relations guy <coughs> whose job it is to twist and manipulate. It's a pretty uninteresting discussion. So yeah, it, it's an issue. Now, it, the other thing that I didn't talk about, but from a science point of view, the people that are, and, and this is a very educated audience, so let me just tell you that. What we looked at in the data about this stuff is it's exactly like tobacco, in that when you, when, when you find a straight line in data, that says, ah, probably an effect. And when you find a straight line pointing down to the, to, to the zero point and no threshold effect, that means that any level of exposure probably has a biological impact. That's true for tobacco. It's also true for dust and diesel particular matter. Um, same exact effect. There can be an impact even from the small amount. And it's linear. It goes up as you get more, but there's no threshold below which it's safe. Um, so in many ways, it's actually very similar to that. I have one more. I don't want to hog the microphone, but I have one more question. And I was at a meeting over here at Texada about a month or maybe it was a little more ago. Um, I asked the uh, fellow from Land and Mines, I think Ed was his first name, I didn't catch his last name. I said, is the maximum amount of tonnage of coal, uh, and I think it, it, it was mentioned 10 million uh, tons of coal a year that can actually be stored uh, on Texada, the site they're going to do. And he said to me, oh, no, no, they can probably go up to 16 million tons. So <laughs> once this whole thing gets in the process, what's going to stop them from just adding more and more and more? Simple answer is nothing. So let me tell you the story, though. Currently, the reason this coal is available is we quit burning in the United States. Okay? We banned and we're dismantling. The last coal-fired power plant in my state is being decommissioned. Okay? And it's happening all over the United States because the pollution, the impact of that pollution is too great. Okay? So that means there's about 120 million tons of coal that is now available to sell someplace else. So what the re it's not chance alone that all these numbers of add up to about 120 million, that's because that's how much is there, okay? So they're, they're, and as we shut down other ones, we shut down three out of six in our, in our state and in Oregon already. Okay, half of them are down, three to go. 
And honestly, I think we're going to shut them down. But that means there's 120 million tons per year of coal that it would be profitable if they could move it to China itself. So I think he would be foolish not to believe that, Jim. I think it's absolutely possible. And uh, so I, I, I'm not optimistic that, that he's wrong. I think he's probably right. And I think just like if they build the, the, all the permits they need, even the states with all the protections I said we have, once they build it, there is absolutely no control of all communities, none. Zip, zero, none. They can expand as much as they want. So I think that's a, a I know that's a couch cleverly as a question, but that's one of the most shrewd comments I've heard. And so you can expect up to 120 million tons coming to BC. Parenthetically, uh, just to give you heart, they have a, had some initial contracts to actually ship it out of Mexico. They know that people are pissed. They know that people in my community are angry and we're not going to put up with it. And quite frankly, I'm not advocating direct action, but there are people that do. And railroads and ships are not, are not, they are very vulnerable ways to ship things. If people, if a community really doesn't want those things here, they are not going to come here. Uh, the talk I gave last Wednesday down in Panorama Ridge, sort of the upper class part of Surrey, is very interesting. A doc came, and he translated for one of my talks in Punjabi. He's a very nice uh, uh, pediatrician, you know, he's a Punjabi, he's got the, you know, the fancy hair and then the little, Laying on his head and wearing a suit, he's a very bright <coughs> guy. And if you know Sikhs, they're very, uh, they're very serious and they're very uh, sincere. And he stepped and he, he made some comments. Uh, he kind of they recognized he came up and made some comments. And at the end of it, he said, "Since you know, he made it very clear that he looked at the literature and he listened to what we said and he was against it." And he said, "And I and my family will stand on the tracks, and these trains will not come and talk to you." And he is a, he's a, a very regular guy. <laughs> a, um, but when, when people say those things, I, I believe them. Let me say one other thing, just inspiring thing, just since there's a little old. I was given a talk right by Surrey Docks, and I hadn't ever been there, so it's kind of fun to, to be in the actual community that's going to be impacted most heavily. And uh, this older guy came up, an elderly guy named David uh, Shinton. And, and they gave me this. And I said, thank you. Uh, but I didn't know what it was. And you all know what this is, right? <laughs> it's a <hockey> puck. <laughs> <laughs> Just to let you know that everybody can do something, it says, coal dust can kill on one side. And it says, no coal dust on the other. <laughs> so I was, again, there are, things that, there are things that people do that give me hope. This is one of them, you know. I mean, people, there's, everybody can do something. Um, but I take this everywhere I go, and it, it gives me hope. Next question. John? Yeah? My name's Karen May. I'm a trustee with the Venanda Improvement District, uh, responsible for the water quality um, in that improvement district. Uh, we had a meeting today about water quality, uh, and there were some concerns. Um, expressed about coal, not directly, because it wasn't the topic of our conversation. However, um, I have concerns. I have some concerns about the water quality and the impact that increased coal traffic might have on our water system, on our aquifers, on our surface water. Um, I'm hearing from you that the dust is going to impact surface water. It, it can. Yeah. Now, do you know anything about aquifers? Um, I'm not an expert in that. I know, I know about people. <laughs> um, I can tell you that there's a recent letter you may have seen from the health officer from here, which yes. raised significant issues about water quality. Yes. That's the person you should engage and, uh, and support their interest in. The, the, that letter, to me, appeared that they had uh, significant concerns. Uh, but they would be the people, who, uh, the way I read the law in Canada, they. Uh, your, your jurisdiction your health officers actually have the power to stop these things if they think it's a big enough threat. Mm -hmm. And I know that all four of the health officers that I have had exchanges with, including the one from here, all believe there is a significant concern about this and that a, you know, a, a year-long study needs to be done before anything happens. And so I think holding them, holding their feet to the fire to make sure that happens. The way the political part of this works, I'm a jurisdiction health officer. If I want to do something that's just my idea, it's going to be really hard to do. 
If my, if, my, if my people tell me I have to do it, it's a very different thing. So I would encourage you to talk to your jurisdiction health officer and say, I'm worried about this. I want answers. I don't want this going through until we have answers. Because if they just go out and live on themselves, they are they're at will employees and they're employed by the province, and the province is not the most progressive group. And you're not going to get a lot of support at the federal level either for getting answers to questions before they do this. They need you to support them. They need you to ask these hard questions and ask them in public and demand that they get you answers. Okay, yeah, well, I know we have to do that, um, and we're working on it. <laughs> but I wondered how much you know about, I mean, they, they're telling me that the, the water they're pouring onto the coal, going down into the ground, is all contained, it's all got a membrane under it, they're all going to, it's not going to leach into the water, and what do you think about that? It doesn't seem like a credible answer. Yeah, so the, what's the long-term impact? What they're going to do, in my opinion, really be the plan is, is for, it is, they don't say it's going to be contained. So the 50 million times they're going to put a billion gallons of water on in my community, they don't, they don't pretend it's going to be contained. It's not. It's going to go down in the ground. And they know that. And the government will have to do that anyway. Because they have to Well, I don't. Because we don't have those studies. Yeah. <laughs> It's really important that you reach out and you ask that your jurisdictional health officer have opinions about this and get you answers. If you're, if you're worried or concerned about this, that's who's supposed to get you answers. And they can't do it unless you tell them to. They'd be out on a limb that would be cut off with politics and money. In my county, you know what happened a few days ago? The coal industry, there's an election going on there and the county has to issue a permit. And there are four people running for county council that, that I think pretty clearly would want a science-based answer about the coal issue. The coal industry put in $150,000 into a political campaign from an organization that around for a few weeks to throw the election. The vote, we, our ballots come out today. They have to be in by the second week in December, in November. And they put $150,000 into a tiny county in Illinois. And Fifty thousand dollars from from two fifty thousand dollar donations from coal industry. Pretty subtle, huh? Yeah, but so you unless the people stand up and demand that the the, the regular systems that that your health officer ask questions, if they go out on a limb, they're going to get cut off. You have they got to have the base of support to ask the questions, a science based answer, objective, independent health impact assessment. That's what you want if you really want to have the baby you need. That's okay. I got a big mouth. Oh, there you go. Uh, Steve Perkins, uh, Dr. Frank, uh, looking on an optimism scale of one to ten, with one being not optimistic at all and one being extremely optimistic, give me your personal number uh, with respect to what are our chances of slowing the onslaught of this invasion. Well, I mean, I'm honestly. I mean, I, I'm, I'll give you my not a professional but a personal opinion. That's what I'm looking for. I think that we're going to stop it in our community, and I think you can stop it in yours. I have absolute confidence in that. It isn't easy. I got to tell you, I have three different jobs. I teach. I do research. I do direct medical care. I, I the past week I've stayed up till three o'clock in the morning more than one night this week working. And what I can tell you is it, it, it isn't going to be easy. <laughs> okay? I can tell you I'm working my butt off. Um, and I can tell you a lot of other people are too. And the reason we're doing that is because we think it's achievable and no, it's not going to be easy. Especially when things like they throw $150,000 into a local election. Clearly, you know, people with real money and real power involved here. And, you know, I'm surprised you've been so kind and gentle on me because I know this is sort of a company I own. You know, everybody works for mainly one employer, um, and I and I and I and that's a difficult situation. You know, I, I think you know people need jobs and they need good jobs. I'm a fan of good jobs. Without jobs, people don't have health care. You know, they don't have everything that they need. Um, but it can't be all one sided. It can't be blind optimism. It has to be informed. It has to be a dialogue. It has to be evidence-based, 
responses. They can't just go do whatever they want. And honestly, the, what I've seen down, down in the lower mainland, they plan to do whatever they want. They really do. They don't care. When they came out with it, I thought there might be a principal discussion and there might be some, with all the jurisdiction health officers calling for health impact assessment, every single one of them, the public being informed and calling for it. I got to say, I was shocked when they said, yeah, we're going to do an EIA and yeah, it's going to be done in two weeks. And yeah, our, our main consultant, who parenthetically has been convicted, uh, we move on to that, uh, who may not be the most objective and fair uh, consultant in the world. Um, you know, I was like, two weeks, really? Yeah. So they're not hearing you. The industrial, uh, you know, and the people that run the quarry here, you know, they're good people doing hard work, making good money. That's all great. But what they're proposing isn't great. You don't have to move forward in that direction. You know, you don't have, you know, is 15 new jobs really worth this without looking at it first? They don't want to spend the money to get the object of information. Maybe they don't want the answer they're going to get. Maybe they're just being thrifty. I don't know. But as a community, I would not stand for, I, I personally will not, I will not stand for that happening to my community or yours. Uh, Dr. Black. No, no, no. no, no, no. I'm just monitoring. I'm not going to start against Heather. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do I need to behave? No. Um, I haven't seen anybody here for the quarry. Somebody who's retired, yes. But it's really divisive. And I'm a waitress at the hotel in Vernanda. And there's a lot of ugly, nasty stuff going on against community against community, people against people, Gillings Bay against Fernanda. And I can't get on the property at that quarry to see what they're doing. I can't. No one wants it. They don't have to ask me anything. They can do whatever they damn well want. They bought up all the property that they possibly can around their quarry. Lafarge is not known to be um, a good uh, feely touchy kind of um, corporation. The guy who runs the building, the, the operation, he lives in Powell River. He doesn't live here. So there's nobody to ask. There's nobody to demand that we, we have a, a, a regional board representative who's not here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Shane, I asked him Shane. I invited Dave. He's not here, but he's for mining and he believes that mining is a really good, clean, safe, wonderful business. I've not seen that, and, um, but I have been supported for my entire life through mining. And it always seems to come down to money or life. And people choose money. I'm not sure how to answer the question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what, I, what, I, what I can tell you is that, you know, uh, I'm not your average doctor. My, my father went to first grade, and that's it. And uh, he was a miner. And the reason I came from Montana out here is that they were using a cave in and it busted his back up where he couldn't work in a mine anymore. Um, and I would have been a miner had that not happened, probably, back in Montana. Um, and so I, I understand, I mean, I, I grew up in a mining community. I, I'm really disappointed that people in the quarry didn't come, because actually, honestly, you, you've got a feeling for who I am as a person. I mean, no bullshit. I'm going to tell you exactly what the truth is, and it's based on science. So if people, I really mean it, if people can come to a different conclusion looking at the same data, please help me, convince me I don't need to do what I'm doing. This is what they do. Wait, but, science. The, so people, when your livelihood is dependent on having a belief, you're likely to have that belief. Okay, I, I feel sorry for those people. It's, it's okay to feel sorry for them, but I don't feel intimidated by them at all. And I think you need to speak truth to power sometimes. Uh, when my employer sent me a copy of the email that they got for all of my information, I realized that people were trying to intimidate me. And you know, that was okay because what I said and what I have said is based on science. And I'm, I'm gonna, I'm actually, I can tell everybody here. I'm going to send them the answer. I've already got 12 pages 
in fine print with lots of footnotes, so I'm going to send it, okay? And I'm going to send it to his boss and to all the unions support the coal lines, and I'm going to try to get it in the paper because I don't mind that public discussion. The, the light of day is going to help everybody. You know, I can be wrong about it. I, I was wrong about it. I was going to know stuff that I was wrong about. I'm glad somebody tuned me up, right? I was wrong about it. Noise turns out to be a baby, but I didn't think it was. Um, so we're all people, we're all wrong about lots of stuff. And, and, and the process of science isn't believing, it's being willing to be wrong and learn. And you just hope you can invite those people. I would encourage you all to invite them, you know, to, 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 to get more information. They're afraid. They're afraid. And fear is what motivates us all. That's not, they're not really me being, fear of being motivated, it invokes everybody in this room. Um, but I think we just need to engage as best we can in a respectful way. The best, the best town hall meetings I've had like this are when people that didn't agree with me showed up and we were able to have a conversation. That's where you get somewhere. That's where I can learn, that's where they can learn. And, you know, it, it is a polarized community and it is something I feel sorry the good doctor that's going to speak. I do not envy him. Because he's got to take care of everybody here and that's his job. And I, I don't expect him to be the kind of doctor I am. It's, it's easy for me to come and say this stuff because I don't, I don't live here. Um, and the person that does live here has to live here with everybody. But you need to still speak truth to power. I'm sorry, it's your job. Everyone here. Hi. My name's Kevin Black. I'm a local doctor. Um, what I want to ask you is, it seems to me there's a chain of, uh, you know, that the, the coal is mined in a certain place, it's shipped by a rail company, it uh, makes its way into Surrey, it's handled at the docks, it's put on the barges, or some of these tugs, or barges, taken up to a Lafarge site, put on the big ships and sent out. Where is the Achilles heel in all this? Where, where can we work on this? Because we, we can't rely on our federal government. We, we know that the federal government is going to, it's going to pick industry every time. When it comes to money, uh, we see that Christy Clark has uh, uh, her policy for the next, the economic future of this province is going to be shale gas, which is another, another very iffy project. Uh, we're not going to wait for scientific information. We're going to do it and worry about it afterwards. You're not going to need any support from her. Our regional district is not supporting us. Our local guy who's supposed to represent us is not supporting us. So, where's the Achilles heel? What, um, we can talk all we want, but I mean, this is a talk shop. It's, it's wonderful, but none of the tech people are here. None of the party people are here. None of the managers are here. And if nobody's from Lafarge. Nobody's here that's going to change their mind. Where, where do you see the point that we can change this? Doctor, I have three answers for you. Okay? First, this is a democracy, and you get to vote. And I think you need to decide how important this issue is to you, and you need to act on that issue. And if that means electing different people to office, all the various different offices, that's what needs to happen. Um, in the United States, in my community, about 35% of people that can vote vote. People have to get off their butts and go and vote. Okay? So that's more. Two is that I think we have to engage in a meaningful discussion. You know, we have to engage people that don't agree in a way that they can hear the message. You know, it won't be easy. But we need to talk to our neighbors. We need to talk to elected officials. We need to ask those questions of our health officers and get them to do the right thing. And until there's a base of people saying they have to do the right thing, that's how they're going to be able to do the right thing. And then the third thing that I think is really important is you see this shirt? You want to buy it? Goodwill. See my pants? Where they come from? Goodwill. I made a personal commitment to conspicuous non consumption. And I think when we all do, I, I don't think, I think the jig is up. I don't think it's about coal. I think it's a much bigger issue. And, I, and everybody in this room is not in their head. Over the past couple of years, I, I get my friends and relatives in a room and I'll get them one-on-one -on -one and I'll say, what do you think? Is the jig up? 
And you know, Republicans, Democrats, business people, media liberals, they, we all know we can't keep living the style of life that we're living. It doesn't work. You know, we, we've gone beyond what's feasible. So we're all going to have to make personal choices and decisions that are different as well. So I think there's a political answer, I think there's a social answer, I think there's a personal answer, and, I, and those are very different. And you know, that's my personal opinion. It's not based on science and the talk I gave. That's based on my own personal judgment, my own personal choices. And I'm willing to say it's from the good will. You know, I don't care. It looks okay. Um, yes, sir. Can, can I follow up just for one thing? Um, if if the people who are living four kilometers away from this uh, coal dump are going to be affected, what's it going to do to the guys who are working there? Hmm. Yeah. Well, the, I, that's one reason I wish they were here, because that's a discussion I'd like to have with them. You know, there's a, there, are, there are safety equipment requirements and things, and, and if you go to the to places that run the very first class way, people are wearing respirators on this stuff, and they're inside control rooms that are sealed with negative pressure. I mean, so there's, it's a serious issue. Most of those coal dust things that happen frequently, they happen to people that are employees in, in, in the handling process. That's who is at highest risk. So I wish they were here because that's an important message they need to get. That when they throw, take that respirator off because it's inconvenient or sweaty or hot or something, and they breathe that stuff down in their lungs, that's not a good thing. They need to know that for their own personal safety. And yeah, you can get away with it for a while, but it's like smoking cigarettes. Yeah, you can get away with it for one year, 10 years, 15 years, and then you have a snake and stroke. You know, these are things there's science about. We know. You know, some people still choose to smoke. I mean, I know all kinds of people. My father smoked. Um, and you do irrational things and take irrational risks. But my father died at 64 years of age from bronchogenic carcinoma, right in between his aorta and his mid and bronchus. So yeah, you can, people can keep making those choices. But there's science that can guide us. There's information that we know. And we have to use that information to get good decisions. If you make decisions on politics and power and money, you make, you make decisions that socialize the cost and privatize the profit. That's not news. If you make it based on science, we have a hope of making good decisions. Yes, sir. Uh, oh, Tim's again. Um, yeah, I tried to come up with this uh, hard question, but uh, I, I keep thinking about uh, most of the world runs on compromise, and so my simple question with uh, probably a hard answer for you, but if you were forced to car compromise, what would, what would that look like? Well, um, compromise is always what happens. It's almost never that everybody gets what they agree with. Not everybody can have everything they want. I, I get that. I have a wife and kids. <laughs> um, so uh, I think that, that adequate attainment, I mean, there are a bunch of You guys have a really pretty much simpler issue than other places in lots of ways because you don't have the trains. <coughs> the train impacts are, are what I think will stop this. Because if you run, this is train's going to go in front of my house every hour of every day. It's about a half mile away, but it's going to be there. And I think the people that are impacted by this are people that are organized, smart, and resource rich. And I think they're going to stop it. Because every hour of every day is unreasonable. Um, so I think, and the other thing that's happening that I think may stop it, parenthetically, is that the price of coal in China is dropping. Every day it's dropping. And there's going to be a window which they're not going to be able to, they may or may not be able to jump through to make it happen. Once they start doing it, it's really hard to stop it, though. They will run things at a marginal, profitable state once they've got the system put in. So there, there's some things, I think, out there that will mitigate some. In terms of practical compromise, you do not want coal dust off-site. So you need to do everything you can to make sure the coal dust stays on-site. Now, second thing, you need to make sure that whatever water comes out of that they are going to spray water or do they got to make that water that sure that water is adequately contained you know, the, the, what comes out of it um, you need to make sure that the ships that come here actually don't run all day and all night that in fact there's electrical uh, utilities that go to them and they run enough shore power rather than running their engines all day and night that's a very practical thing that's doable and there's a there's a long list of practical things that can be done and each time you do one of those things it costs the company money they're not going to do it unless you make them do it 
but there, there, there may be some in game that looks like compromise. Um, the, uh, you know, every car and truck made in the United States that's diesel does not put out any diesel particulate matter for more than two years. That technology is there. You could say those ships have to run on electricity when they're at the port. Now, lots of places in the states, we have a law that says that. But it, it has this little thing that says, if the ship has the capacity to do it, and they bring rebuilt ships in that don't have the capacity to do it. So you can make them upgrade. You can cut into their profit margin. So I asked the, the people running the port where I'm at, what that 55 million tons of coal were generating profit. They said $5.5 billion. So could they afford some of those things? Yeah. The people doing it in my community are, and they're probably the same people here. Uh, Goldman Sachs, you've heard of, 49% partner. Uh, SSA Marine, the largest operator of, of ports in the world that are privately held. Um, and Berkshire Hathaway, uh, which is one of the most successful investment firms that also happens to own uh, Burlington and Santa Fe. Um, those are pretty formidable people. <laughs> and pretty smart people. But there's lots of money. They should be willing to compromise. Now, they're not going to want to. If they think they can run over you, which I think they... they looking at what they proposed, all the mitigation they're going to do at the at, down in Delta, and none of the mitigation they're going to do up here, they think they're going to roll you. They think you're not going to stand at the same. They, you, you already know that, right? <laughs> And they think because this is sort of a company town that anybody that stands up in opposition is going to get slapped around uh, socially, mind you, probably not physically. Um, okay. And we're already experiencing that to some extent. Well, you know, this ain't this ain't the 22-year-old crowd. Uh, I wish we had them here, actually. I've been trying to figure out how can we get them here. Now, a lot of them leave the island probably because not a lot of jobs. But um, you got to get youth involved, and it's got to be attractive to them. And they got to care about it because they're the future. And anyways, we're the past and we're the problem. So, but unless we get kicked out to youth, it's not going to stand a little chance of getting those compromises. I mean, people have to see this in their best interest to make those compromises. And a company town works both ways. I mean, the company town also, if everybody agrees on something, the company's got to change. Yes, sir. Okay, my, my question has to Actually, do with Actually, Tom, yep, uh, Terry is next. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Uh, sorry. <coughs> sorry. 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 Uh, Terry Hollow, I live in Van Anda, and I attended the Waterworks uh, conference this morning, which was very informative, and a representative from the Vancouver Coastal Health was there. And in a letter from his boss to um, Ed Tachi, Ministry of Mines, was that um, they recommended a health assessment, just as you had said. But also it says, well, VARS has a poor track record in addressing concerns of runoff from the limestone quarry that has affected neighborhood watershed, which is Van and the Priest Lake, specifically, with elevated metals and nitrates. And um, Dan Glover is presently working with the VARS to resolve these serious contamination dis issues. But since 2009, there has been very little progress towards resolution. And I asked him what the consequences of blatantly polluting a watershed was. And long story short, was really nothing. There is no real consequences. Um, they do it. They're supposedly in conversation. So until there's no conversation, they can continue polluting. They're poisoning your stinking watershed. That's right. Since 2009. People, people should be unhappy about that. <laughs> <laughs> and they should be so. Absolutely. At some point, the record, you, know, you have to end up on their doorstep, and you have to say, this is not okay, and you're going to change. I mean, my mother was a redhead Irish woman. Man, I would, she, <laughs> yeah. Um. So my, my point is that um, we're addressing and, and really fighting hard today, and all of us are concerned about coal storage on Texada. Whereas, in fact, we do already store coal on Texada Island and have so for 22 years right. or a bit more. And originally I thought it was just for to provide um, on the Campbell River Quinson Coal a provision of loading onto deep sea ships. Is that was the reason why. Now we're also importing coal from the interior of BC, which I was not aware of. So the licensing did increase along the way somehow. But my question is, 
we're concerned about stopping an increase in coal. What about stopping the coal that's there now? Yeah. So in, in economics, and I'm not an economist, but there's something called externalities. So you externalize costs. And so what they've done is they have, they've externalized costs. They're putting coal here, and they're saving the money of not safely containing. Um, they're doing that now, and they'll probably do that more in the future. And as long as you let those externalized costs fall to you, and to the environment, and to your children, and your grandchildren, they're going to keep doing it. You have to put those externalized costs right back on the bottom line, so that they're actually paying the full cost. Now, it's good. It's good democracy. It's good capitalism. It's all those things. That's the way it's supposed to work. And by them distorting that, they get away with being socialists. They're they're taking they're taking the goods. They're making you pay the cost. You know, you can't you can't let them get away with it. Okay. It's just a matter of. I mean, it's. I read, the, I read the original letter about that, and I can tell you that, to me, that's a clear violation. That means that I would go around asking my community members to chip in 20 bucks each, and we'll hire a Harvard Green lawyer and go after it. Now, just to let you know, part of the reason that I bother to do the things that I do like this is that 17 years ago, a pipeline blew up my community. You guys might have heard about it. Down in, down in Whatcom County, a pipeline blew up there. And three kids died, two 10-year-olds and an 18-year-old. And one of those kids was my patient. His family had to take care of. Um, and uh, it became clear as the investigation went on that, that the people that did that uh, did it recklessly and intentionally. They, they knew there was a problem with the pipe at that point. They drove to it, parked their car on top of it, and then wrote on the form, we couldn't find, or we couldn't approach it. And it was unapproachable, so we didn't pass it. And then it became clear that the computer actually shut the pipeline down, and they manually turned it on for 17 minutes and ran a big pipe of gasoline into a creek right through the middle of town. Um, and then it became clear that they had those kind of abuses chronic over time, that senior management optimized their profit by not ever responding appropriately. Now, that's pretty grim. So over the first couple of years of work, I, I invited a dozen friends for coffee the next morning. We all threw $20 on the table, and we said, OK, we're getting more of Over time, I raised $60,000. We hired a Harvard-trained lawyer. We hired a lobbyist in D.C., and we got our hind ends kicked. Okay? They took our law that we wrote, and they gutted it and sent it back out there. And we opposed the law that we wrote, <laughs> in the politically. But over a couple more years, we got a good uh, person from the uh, from Justice Department, a good lawyer for the leaders, we got a good judge. And at the end of the day, three of the four corporate executives went to prison. There's a $100 million fine, which basically was the corporate death penalty. They were put out of business. And we got a $5 million trust fund. It's still down there. Carl Weinman runs it uh, to see that those kind of pipeline closures never happen again. So you can win. But for years, it took years, and it took people putting their effort and their money up to do what was achieved. And doing it smart, you know, but working hard, staying up late at night, giving up time with your family, all the stuff it takes to, to make those things happen. You can do it. Now, the thing that I'm impressed at is how many really smart and really caring people are in this room. And when I, met, when I first met, uh, Carolyn, my grandma's in solution, so I'm, I'm attracted to that, you know. But, uh, but I got to tell you, uh, this pebble in the pond thing, it's a clever name. These three women, women always have more power than men. Because they really mean what they say. Guys, a little worthy, or she. Women, when they say it, I listen really carefully. Because they usually mean it. Um, and there's power. Um, so I think, you know, there's, there's a, a real, there's an intelligent, educated community here. You, you, it's a small area, you can organize. And if you organize, you will win. You just have to care enough to do it. You have to all have each other's email, you have to have each other's phone numbers, the people that care about it, that get involved. And, you know, the force of a community group that really means it is irresistible. They cannot win. If you don't want them here, if you, want, if you don't want what they're doing here, they are not, they can't do it. You just have to care enough to make that happen.
I don't mean to be glib. I'm quite serious. Yes, sir. I agree with you, but I want to go back to Kevin's question. He was looking for an Achilles heel, and you brought up in your presentation that tobacco was something of an analogy for dealing with the coal health implications. And I'm thinking about all the people I see on the Texada Tex Facebook pages who are in their 20s and 30s and who work for the coal company, I mean, uh, <laughs> who work for Lafarge, and who are worried about their jobs, and their friends who are worried for their friends' jobs. And I have friends at that quarry, and I'm worried about their jobs too. So we're caught in a tight place here, and yes, we can organize, and we probably can stop it, and I think that's great. However, what would help a lot, and you could help tonight right now, is to give us that Achilles heel in the form of a medical picture. And the closest thing I've heard was when you drew a line, you said 2.5 microns gets past your upper respiratory systems into your lungs and, a and alleges in some Latin sounding thing. So could you do something about that? Give us, give us the equivalent of what it took to stop tobacco. Give us the image that we can use with people who are scared for their jobs so that they'll wake up to reality. Well, I think you bring up a couple of really good points. One is that, that fear is what motivates us all and makes us crazy. Okay? And it's not just those people in Farge. It makes us all fish into irrational things. So if fear is a deal, we have to sow the seeds of, of compassion and understanding and sympathy. That we need to care about these people. And what's weird to me is that I don't see why are they afraid of losing their job? They know they're not going to take, they're not gonna take away any jobs, right? Mm -hmm. At all? Not really true. There's, there's problems with limestone, too, in terms of economics. It's the construction industry, and we all know where that is. It's in the doldrums, basically. So what they're hoping is they get a backhaul. If the coal comes up, they can backhaul limestone down and keep their limestone jobs. That's what's also behind this. Yeah, one of the things I encourage everybody to do is to study something that I absolutely hate. So what I absolutely hate more than is economics. Because it's mostly lying. It's not science. You know, it's just made up stuff. But if you look at the numbers, look at, and, and all this stuff's generally available. You can find how profitable the park is. You can find how much they take, how much their CEO takes home every year. You can find out a lot of stuff like that. And honestly, I bet it would be embarrassing to the park if you actually knew what their profit was and what their profit margin was and what their CEO made and how much they were turning on their profit to their to their shareholders. Those are things worth knowing. You don't know them. You're not playing. You're not a very good game player. Here. Okay. So knowing those things and making sure that the, the average guy that works there knows that he's getting paid chicken feed, even though it's a pretty good job compared to what the other people are, and know that they will sell you out at every corner. I mean, if and it's not bad people. The way our financial system works, as best I understand it, and Helen is the doctor, um, is that you know. They have to optimize profit, and if they don't, they will discard whatever leader is there, and they'll find somebody else who will optimize profit. And your job is to make sure that that profit is gotten fairly, and it's not at the expense of other people. And so I think you have to simply get the facts. So I would try to get the, the facts. I mean, and it's the modern era. When, this, when I got this email from this guy, I knew everything about him in 10 minutes. You cannot hide in the internet world. You can't. I know a lot about the coal companies and, and the proposed projects here because I read their annual reports. They've been talking about this for years. And it's in their annual reports. They, and, and they share it out there. They, you know, uh, the, some of the people most valuable to me are people that are business guys that, that share some of my values about this, that go over the business literature and tell me what's going on in the business world. Uh, Goldman Sachs just issued a report that said that coal was a really bad investment. <laughs> You know, there's the people selling it to one person and telling other people bad investment, don't do it. That's really valuable information. So I think you have to look at the big picture and kind of bring those people on board as best you can. Everybody needs a job. The reality is, is but back to one of the things I said, which I really am really interested about, is that we have to change the society. It's not going to work, and we have to care about each other because people are going to be dislocated. I think there's going to be substantial changes in our lifetime that are going to dis 
dislocate a lot of people that are used to having a very kind of wealthy way of life. And I, it's my personal opinion that that's history. That we have to be happy with a lot less. I, mean, I, I, I have a 900 square foot house I live in, 900 square feet. It's not the average doctor's house. Um, uh, you know, I think we need to make those accommodations now. And the sooner we make them, and the more we share that pain, the less likely anybody's going to be run over by it. Um, now, that's something we're not used to. We're a hyper-individualistic society. I spent about three or four months a year working in Asia in very, very poor places. Now, what I can tell you is they're a hell of a lot happier than we are. They don't have stink. And they are genuine. I don't, I don't want to come home sometimes because they're a lot happier than we are here. And we have everything. Um, one of the things I have up in my, in my room at home in our kitchen is a sign that was my mom's for years and years and years. And, and I keep it there because it's really important to me. And the sign says, the best things in life are not things. <laughs> I think, honestly, we need to take that seriously. We need to make, sure, we make, we need to make a commitment to everybody in the community that we're going to take care of. You know, that we're going to be a community that meets not just a bunch of transient people. It can't be the wealthy, retired people and the working class out there saying, if that's what it is, everybody loses. We have to be a real community that really cares about each other. And to give them the confidence not to be afraid. Because that's what they are. It's a hard discussion to have. But you can just say, you're afraid. <laughs> you don't need to be afraid. Let's work on this. Let's find a solution. Let's find other kinds of jobs. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be industry, 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 corporate, corporate, corporate. You can find ways to make livings here that are creative and new and different. That's the challenge. What about some of the retired people who got money to come here? What about what about finding two jobs? What about finding four jobs? What about finding some creative new way to do to, to make a living? I know I heard there's some uh, you know, we should legalize marijuana in Washington State, which I think is a terrible idea. But I've heard that that's an industry here on the island. <laughs> I mean, maybe you can find it legal or something. I mean, in all seriousness, I think you have to find things that are going to support everybody here and be a community. If you're not a community, we're toast, okay? We have to be a community. We have to care about each other. We have to care about those people. The reason I wish they would have come is I think it's an opportunity for a beginning. It's not a fight. It's how can we help you? How can you help us? How can we get the information you need to make wise decisions? That's what's going on. It's not people beating. You know, I'm not a hired gun when you're coming in from out of town to shoot people. I'm trying to ask you really hard questions. If you were listening, you heard me ask really hard questions of you. I expect you to get out your billfold. I expect you to schedule your time. I expect you to make a difference in your community. That's a hard question we got for you. And I'm here to tell you, if you don't do it, you can have bad, bad outcomes. The other thing I can tell you is that my involvement in this, I have met wonderful people. Oh, Owen back there, he drove up the A. I love the guy. Man, he's working his butt off for nothing and doing a great job and having a good time to it. Caroline, I mean, she tells me what to, she tells me something, I do it. All I say is yes, ma'am, I'll show up. You know. And that, that all the people that have helped me uh, be part of this, I developed a community of people that I love and love me. What's the last time you could say that? That's a new community of people that I care, I love. I'm not shying away the elder that love me. Okay? And, and that's, what, that's why we're here. Let's say in a church. Most of my talks end up being a church that feel kind of churchy. Okay, but, but those core values of caring about each other, being a community, making it work for everybody, those are core values. Life is not going to get easier for any of us. If you think that, you're not reading the newspaper, even, let alone the journal articles. Okay? Life is not going to get easier. It's going to get harder. And if we can do it and do it together, there's a future for all of us. There's more than enough money in the same world. It ain't, it ain't lack of resources a problem. When I go to India and see all these kids that are orphans that are happy as stink, let me tell you, I, money is not the problem. We have houses around that are empty most of the year. What's the problem is caring about those people. 
And not, not, not letting that wall between you be a wall. Take it down. Invite it into your life. But it's going to take your time and your money to do it. I'm sorry, but that's what it takes. Yes, sir. I uh, really like what you said those last few minutes. Uh, they came from the heart. Uh, I've enjoyed the whole evening. Thank you. Uh, there's something uh, that doesn't quite s square off, and I wondered if you uh, could help me on that. Uh, I think you use understatement and uh, ask your audience to dot the line and make a connection themselves. Uh, but uh, somehow there is the impression that the coal dust only travels for four to five kilometers. And then earlier in, in, in the evening, you said, well, sometimes it can go further. You also earlier had said, there's mercury traceable to Chinese uh, coal dust in Lake Watkin, that's in Seattle, 5,000 miles over there, or kilometers, whatever, in China. That's where the origin is. How does that pixie dust get over there? If it only travels four or five kilometers. Yeah. Well, the, the coal dust is actually a much larger particle than the stuff that goes up once it's burnt into the high atmosphere, into the winds, and get blown over here. So they're pretty different things. I really do believe coal dust goes at most about eight kilometers, routinely four or five. And I, th I think that's real. But those are large, heavy particles that are pretty hard to blow, OK? The stuff, once it's combusted, becomes you know, elemental mercury that then turns into who knows what when it goes up in the sky in these big hot burners. I mean, that's a whole different thing. And it, 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 we know it can go a long, long way. The, all those details, they matter some. I mean, you need to get the details right. You can't get the details wrong. But I still think that the key thing is what you said to start with. It's really the message about caring and wanting it to a solution that's going to make everybody have a future and taking the fear away. I think that's the most important thing. So, but to try to answer your question, people, cold dust particles are very large. They're, they're generally, most of the cold dust is about 10 microns or larger. So they're pretty big and they're not going to go a long way. They do have a lot of nasty stuff in them. It's pretty stable. It's, it's part of a rock, you know, it's not. It's not dripping wet. Um, it can get into, in, into water, though, and, and when it gets in water, it can cause problems. And we need to look at that in a principled, disciplined, scientific way to find out, through the best modeling, the best science we have, exactly what the impacts are going to be. That the proponents don't want to do that really bothers me a lot. That they don't want to take the time to do a health impact assessment. That's the thing that bothers me the most of anything. Because it's a very reasonable request. Let's take the science. There's enough science here that there may be significant problems that I think it's overwhelming. The reason I go to these talks is because that's what I want people to tell other folks and spread the word. There's enough things to be concerned about that we have to take this data and we have to model it for a particular location and see what the impacts are. Then we're capable of doing it. The science is out there. We have to do that. If we don't, this is going to happen, and we're not going to know what the consequence is until there are real consequences and real people. And I, I don't think we have to wait until then. If I could just have a quick follow-up question, if, if I may. Yeah. Yes. Can I this last question? Uh, our regional district uh, passed a motion and it had a contingency in it. And I'm not quite sure how it is worded, but uh, in essence, it seems to me that they approve uh, the uh, uh, project uh, as long as there are no um, re uh, detrimental repercussions. Is, isn't that correct? Something to yeah, that effect? Uh, well, could we perhaps exert pressure on the regional district to uh, support looking into a study 
uh, that would determine whether there are detrimental impacts. You, you asked the best question of the night. Thank you, sir. Um, yes, that's exactly what you should do. And that's exactly what the jurisdiction hold up has already asked for. That's exactly what I'm asking for. And that's exactly what you should ask of them. In fact, you shouldn't ask it. You should demand it. Sometimes you have to be a little stronger. And I think given where they've been, I think it's time to say very forcefully and directly, we want answers. And we want, we want them through an objective, independent process that's going to give us scientifically based answers. That's what you want them to do. And it sounds like that's what they're committed to doing. And I think you have to take them at their word. If they think that was just a way to get out of the community off their back, that's, that's fine. But they said it, hold them accountable to it. And on top of that, they have a uh, sustainability plan that would support exactly such a thing. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. I'm going to move really quickly into the final segment, which is, where do we go from here? I'm going to be asking Carol Ann to uh, talk very briefly about her involvement in Paw River and her links to uh, groups in the Lower Mainland. And uh, also, I hear we have Chris Bernard from Burnaby uh, wanting to ask a question. So. After Carol Ann speaks, uh, we'll have an open discussion. Uh, Carol Ann. Thank you, Linda. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight. And, and thank you for welcoming a few of us from Cal River into your community. I uh, have worked for a couple of months now on this issue. I'm born and raised in Cal River. I've gotten to hear from some of you here, some of you signed the rather lengthy letter that I wrote to the regional district board members and I really appreciate that support. Um, I gave a 30 minute presentation to the regional board members and several people got up and spoke after the presentation, at which time the regional board members unanimously voted in favor of the expansion without, with yes, a slight um, addition to the to the motion to send a letter to the ministry saying they were in favor of the project, um, just vaguely saying that they wanted to ensure that all proper monitoring of the environmental you know, impacts are kept close eye on by the province, which we know that that doesn't happen. And we know from Dr. Paul Hardike's letter that Lafarge has been contaminating the drinking water in Priest Lake for a number of years and not doing anything to mitigate that. That's a concern. I think that is um, something that needs to be asked of Lafarge. If this expansion goes through, how much more contamination will, will be seen on Texada in the, the watersheds, the farmlands? Um, one of the reasons that was given, well, really the main reason, jobs, but the main reason that the regional board directors said that they had, they had to vote in favor of this expansion permit amendment was even though uh, one of the board members, a representative for the city of Palo River, Russell Brewer, brought up the fact that the sustainability, sustainability charter for Palo River and region, which includes Texada, clearly states that using the precautionary principle, you need to look at pro projects of this scope and magnitude and you need to take into consideration the global view, the long view, how the impacts of this project will impact locally, globally, I mean, the whole thing, we thought, this was a sure thing, the sustainability charter is gonna save us, and they can't vote for it. But they absolutely threw the sustainability charter out the window, and they said that the, they had to vote in favor of this expansion amendment because the, the Texada official community plan states that, that they must vote for industry, and they must vote for mining. Nowhere in the Texada official community plan, and I don't know if any of you have read it, some of you may have been involved in the process of, of writing the official community plan, but I read it, and nowhere in that plan does it say anything about coal, coal storage, or coal transshipment. It talks about mining, it talks about supporting industry, 
but it goes into a huge detail about protecting the environment, protecting your watersheds, protecting the farmlands, protecting agriculture, protecting the community and health. So how could they stand there and tell us that they're voting for this expansion when they, because of the Texada OCP? It's absolute bullshit. I'm sorry, but they, there's no way that they can look you straight in the eye and say, no, the Texada OCP says that we need to vote in favor of this. It's not true. And I think as a community, I, I hope that you can get together and berate the regional district board members. I mean, they've already sent their recommendation in to the Ministry of Energy and Mines that they are in favor of it and that there was no opposition, even though I had, I had 600 signatures on both written letter petition and an online petition, some of which were from on the online petition were from other places in the world, but I had signatures also from concerned residents in Comox, Gabriola Island, around, you know, that are also concerned about the freighters going by their communities. So there was a lot of opposition and they are basically saying there was no opposition. Uh, Director Colin Palmer actually went on CBC radio, a morning show, and uh, to the day before the vote and said there was no opposition and there were no negative impacts. He said that on the CBC radio. So as a community, we need to speak up because this is the only way that there's any dialogue or discussion even being even happening, is we have to we have to ask hard questions of Lafarge. We have to ask the regional directors. We have to push for the things that we want. I live in Powell River. Yes, the cold dust may not make it over to my community, but I care about you. I care about this community. I care about the communities down in the Lower Mainland have to deal with the train, all the train issues and the diesel particulates. The whole scope of the project is just so, such a huge magnitude that I care about that. I, it's not about me, it's about, it's about you. And as a community, if you can get together, like we are trying to do in Powell River, there's a lot of people that when, when Dr. James first came to town and I brought him into the Evergreen Theater, we had about 60 people come out. It was a beautiful sunny evening in August. 60 people came out and they all left feeling very irate and wanted to sign petitions and wanted to make action and wanted to, who do I contact? And they've sent letters. They've sent letters to the provincial government, the federal government, to the local regional members. I mean, you feel like you're beating your head against the wall, I guess, sometimes, but we have to keep doing that. We have to get together. We have to talk to. We have to send these letters and 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 organize and work together because I think as a broad community, it makes more impact. And I think part of the dialogue that we've been having in Powell River and being noisy about it pushed our Powell River City councilors to vote in favor of making a motion to send a letter to the Ministry of Energy and Mines, to the Ministry of Environment for BC, the Ministry of Environment for Canada, and the Premier, saying they want an environmental impact assessment, they want a health impact assessment, they want these studies done before this project goes through. So thankfully that somewhat lightened the ramifications of the in favor unanimous vote. So in terms of next steps, I would say absolutely contact me. Um, we're forming a, a really incredible community, as you know, Dr. James mentioned. I've met so many amazing people, and it's so nice to meet some of you face to face because I've been emailing a lot of people here and and in the Lower Mainland. There's an amazing network of people who are really pissed off about this and really want to do something. So we need to work together because as a as a community, we can have a much more powerful voice. And so please contact me. Give me your give me your thoughts. You know, I am going down next. Sunday actually to New Westminster and I'm speaking at a, a large rally with some pretty amazing speakers and and I'm going to tell them what's going on from this perspective and I mean I have to tell them that this community is divided. I have to tell them of the bullying that I've been receiving on the internet from some of the workers at Lafarge that just don't understand. They don't understand, they don't, they don't understand the concerns and they, it's fear. So I'm going to present that, and tomorrow we're presenting, Dr. James is presenting out at SLAM at First Nation. So I hope that we have a good turnout tomorrow because, again, the First Nations, I don't know how much they've been consulted on this. I don't think very much at all because the people that I've talked to that came to hear Dr. James initially in August had no knowledge of the project. They haven't been kept up to speed on what's happening. So 
it's talking to people, engaging in dialogue, presenting the facts, and, and having a calm discourse with people that especially a lot of people say, but yeah, but it's, it's good, it's, there's good jobs, and I'm not really that worried about it because it doesn't impact me. But having that conversation on how broad it is, and I find that that's pretty effective when you talk one-on-one -on -one to people, so that's, I just wanted to say that. So <laughs> thank you for having me here, and um, I did you want to say? Oh, Chris Bernard? Do you have Chris's note? Oh, Chris. Yes. Thanks. Thanks. Um, Chris Bernard uh, who lives part time in Gillies Bay and part time in Burnaby, has been following us religiously on the internet and bearing with our technical glitches. He wanted to know and ask uh, Dr. James and others, what our legal options are in, in dealing with this issue. I, I, and I apologize. I'm I'm, uh, I'm not a lawyer, and I have no idea, honestly. I, I think that there are some lawyers that have uh, begun to take an interest in it and actually uh, might volunteer their services. There's at least one I talked to up here in Canada. I know there's a group uh, of attorneys in. Uh, in that we work with, I have a, a Harvard trained lawyer that I'm working with that's volunteering his time. There are people from two different organizations working on it legally in the United States. There's the Earth Justice Group, which is helping us legally, and there's another group, um, NDRC, which is based in you know, DC, and they're, they're also working on it mainly in California. So there are, are groups working on it doing legal work. I, I wish I knew more about it. I know there's a group that, that and then there's an individual lawyer who's working on it as well. What the real legal options are, I, 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 I have to say, I really don't know. Um, I'm not an expert in that, so sorry. Um, yes, there are a number of lawyers who volunteered their services already, and uh, voters taking action against climate change uh, have requested a federal environmental assessment and also pertain the services of eco-justice. Um, back to the issue of what to do next, I'd like to follow up on what Carol Ann said uh, about how important it is for this small community to network with other communities throughout the Salish Sea and the Lower Mainland. And I would like to propose that Texeda host a meeting of all these people here on Texeda to remind them that we really exist we need to be taken into account in any environmental impact assessment. And I think more and more people need to be exposed to the beauty of Texeda Island so that we're not just an, an empty space on the map. So that's my suggestion for next steps. And I think Farron is going to volunteer to start writing down these suggestions on the flip chart so we all know where we're going. So I'll hand it back to Linda to facilitate this session. Linda? Yes, yes. sure. Yes. Yes. I, I just want to, I just really want to comment more than anything. And earlier, um, when we first started, my name's Tracy and I, I live in Van uh, When we started a little earlier, um, somebody mentioned and that we can't hold our local politicians responsible and we can't um, sue them or go after them for any negligence that potentially could come from this. But in this particular case, and you need to text it, and I think that everybody should be aware of it, the policy decision that was made was made on the original application, which was to allow coal to be here. And so you cannot go after the government for a policy decision. We can't do that here in British Columbia, that's a true statement. But if it is an operational decision, which would be an expansion or an amendment, the government can be held responsible for those decisions. And so I think that our first step does have to be back to the regional district because that decision to vote yes and to push that through, any of the regional level people, any of the different departments within the provincial government, they actually can be held responsible because in our instance, it's an expansion and it's an amendment. The policy was already made to put the coal here, so we actually have a case that we can go after them. So I just wanted to share that. 
How do we put that in point form? I don't know. <laughs> Thanks, Tracy. I have some time. I have a few concerns about next steps. I was uh, pretty deeply involved in the last two truly divisive mining issue, which was uh, the Lehigh issue in 2009. And it just killed me. It was the most divisive thing I've ever been involved in in my life. Friends and neighbors on opposite sides not trusting each other. And I see it all happening again right here tonight. There's nobody here who's, quote, on the other side, and there are friends and neighbors. And the talk about bringing people from off island in here to have a big meeting, and you're going to set off another war like we had in 2009. And we don't need that. So my suggestion is we have a dialogue on Texada, among Texadans. And we try to work out something that we can all live with. Thank you. Hi, my name is Bob. I live on the island here. Uh, I'm just reflecting on, on this whole situation here, and for me, this is a moral issue. It's about taking responsibility for what happens uh, in other parts of the world. Uh, the people that mine the coal are just uh, as uh, in this shit as we are. The people that burn it, the people that transport it, everybody is affected. We have a divided island here. And there's a lot of people that are really afraid about their jobs and their families. They, they've been working this limestone uh, mine for probably more than four generations. And they have no other fantasy or no other way of life. And I think it's really important that the people here who are the converted reach out to your neighbor. If you know somebody that works at the quarry, take them aside and discuss it person to person without pressure and, and just try to talk about this so we can avoid all the, 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 the hysteria and the name calling and, and that unreasonable attitude. And I think if we can reach out individually and talk to our neighbors, we'll go a long way to mitigating a more agreeable situation. What about town? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we were just talking about that in a recent meeting that we had, and because uh, Texas Action Now um, tries to everybody who lives on Texada, every property owner on Texada is a member of TAN. We jokingly said you actually have to buy your way out. Um, and that we, we feel that our, the community, for us to get onto that, um, we couldn't take a, a side on it. I, I guess the only thing I could ever see is that we could try to maybe hold a meeting about it, um, but we haven't been able to actually say that uh, we don't want the coal because there's too many people that would like it or that are on board with it, and then there's too many people that are not on board with it. So TAN in itself couldn't take, is not, that we don't feel like we can take a position without um, creating more division within the community. The only, and we didn't actually talk about it, um, about being able to hold a public forum on it. I suppose that would be, you know, another possibility. Again, I wonder, I suppose if it's advertised in a way, we might get people on both sides of the fence to come together to talk about it. This is your discussion here, not mine, okay? But just something for you to think about. I personally, I'm not for or against they're bringing coal here. I'm not. I'm in favor of having a health impact assessment that gives you the knowledge that you, where you would actually know what the impacts are. And I can tell you that nobody knows what the impacts are now. That I know. So I think a good place might be to start to say, let's find out. 
let's all make a commitment to getting the knowledge we need to protect our workers, to protect our property, protect our children, protect our elders. Let's get the knowledge first and not, not run into it. So I think there's a, there's a, there's a like I say, honestly, in our, in our medical group, we're not for or against the cold pork in our community. But we believe that there's enough concern and enough serious questions that we need that study done with the modeling and the numbers and all that before you can make a reasonable decision. And so I'd encourage you to think in that direction. This for and against stuff, the divisiveness doesn't get you anywhere. It never will. And so look for those, that's what we've done at least. We've tried not to, not to polarize it. And we've been able to keep a very, our doc group is extremely diverse. There are people that card care Republicans that, uh, you know, that, that believe that, uh, you know, they're very different beliefs and values. But, but we do share that commitment to reason and facts and, and, and information. And that's, I would encourage you to do that. You know, invite them in. Yeah. Make the tent big. Defend their right to have a job. Encourage there to be more jobs. So those are all good, great goals. Very good. I didn't mean to be intrusive, just, just wanted to share that little insight from all of you. No, absolutely, and I really appreciate bringing it back down to that kind of a level of um, how do we figure this out together. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. uh, and that's how do we create the place for that conversation. Um, so I'm not sure about town. It would, I, we, need, we need more feedback from our community on how to actually do that and not be and do that polarization thing. And we will be, we're just coming up against our AGM, uh, well, coming up against our year end, so the AGM we were just trying to figure out was probably in January sometime. Um, and maybe that's a place of uh, uh, being able to speak. So as I move over to Richard here, I'm just gonna briefly uh, let you know that um, concerning inviting people into this uh, meeting, I approached five community groups, all five to sponsor Dr. James. I'm not talking financially. Just to say, yes, we're interested, we'll support this talk. Everybody said no. So my, my seriously think about how do, would we invite people into this group? Linda, what were the five groups? Richard is what were the five groups you approached? I would just like to know. Can you tell us? Uh, I the seniors group was approached. Um, the health board was approached. Um, the library was approached. Who else was approached? Chamber of Commerce. Chamber of Commerce Twin. was approached and Twin. Twin. So it was not for a lack of trying. Uh, it's, it's not an easy thing to do to bring people in. It was also, just to let you know, uh, I faced some difficulties advertising this event also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's uh, switch it again. Um, picking up on Leslie's point, I mean, I would personally, I mean, if we're talking about dialogue here, um, TAN would seem to be the organization that has been set up for that very purpose, to not to take sides, but to actually be the body that can actually create the dialogue between the different interests and communities on the island. And you just have to look at the, because uh, I know we had spent a lot of time getting the constitution together, and this, this item seems to hit the constitution right down the middle. And it's the sort of item that town really needs to get into gear, I feel, and try and bring the community together. This is particularly so because we've heard of the potential health impacts and impacts in the, to the water shed. And these aren't going to go away, and they're going to be permanent if this thing gets approved without us knowing the impacts. It'll be too late. So I do think that we should all try to be as informed as we can. Uh, and really, I think TAN would be a, a wonderful organization to do that for the island. Can I just mention that um, your, your board member on the regional district board actually said in his little 
little speech about why he was voting in favor of it, he actually said that, well, I haven't heard from Tan, so that tells me that they have no concerns about this project. He actually said that in the meeting. Yeah, so, and I think it's a lack of really knowing about it. I think it was kind of skirtled through and nobody heard about it till the last minute and it wasn't really advertised, so I would be pissed if I was part of Tan and he was using that to say, well, they didn't come to me with any concerns, so there are no concerns on Texas. I've got one question actually for Dr. Jen. Please correct me, but did you say that the med medical officers have the power to stop this on medical grounds? Um, um, I'm not a Canadian and I'm not a lawyer, but as I read it, if, if there's a substantial health concern that they do have the ability to stop it. That, that's my interpretation of it. But I can all, you know, you've got to have some compassion here. The other thing, you've got to know, these are at-will employees working with provincial government. And they, they've been, I think, very brave and very forthcoming in, if you've read the letters they've written, they're very clear. They expect a, a health impact assessment to be done. They expect it to take to six to 12 months. They've been very explicit about it. And they, they're doing what they can. But as you know, it's not always about legalities and technicalities. There's got to be people standing up behind them saying, we, we, have, we want that. So technically, do they have to do it? That's the way I read the rules. At a practical level, if they did that, and they may never had a job again, or they lost their job, or they got demoted, or they got passed over promotions, there's a serious impact to going against your boss. Uh, so I think, I think that's something, there's not a great uh, guy with a white hat sitting come save you, okay? If that's what you're asking for, the answer is no. It, it, does it depend upon you to do? I honestly think it's gonna take you putting your billfold and your time into the effort to building the kind of effort you, that it's gonna take. And this, it sounds like, I hadn't appreciated how polarized this community is. Like I didn't, I didn't know that about it, because I'm not an informed guy and I'm not from here, I didn't know. I do, I do know about some of the polarization that's happened with the First Nations in some of the community. And I'm going to try to put as much uh, healing on that as I can tomorrow. That's, that's one of the other main reasons I came here, was to, to try to bring those groups together. Because I think they need to be together. It doesn't serve anybody well for the... And it, it didn't sound like that handled great the last time there was a big conflict about the resort construction. You have to come together. Divided, you cannot win. So you have to bring those people over, and you have to do whatever it takes to do that. And honestly, I really think you have to start from a position not thinking you know the answer. I mean, what I know about is I know there can be substantial health impacts from a variety of things that are going, would occur if this happened. I don't know how many people will be impacted. I don't. And, and it's going to take really thinking about it and spending time and effort and money to know. And so that's what it's going to take. And I, and I think, in my experience, the union people, which are kind of on the other side from us in, in my community, those union people are smart people. And they have every time said, we support health impact assessment to the, to the horror of, their, of the other person sitting beside them. You know, because the, 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 the company shill doesn't want to say that ever. Because it slows things down and it costs money. Thank you. I'll be, I'll be brief. Um, I'd like to thank you for inviting me to your community. I'm, I'm a newbie. Uh, as you see in Delta, I was the MLA for the years. And I thought I'd get away from it. You can't ex escape industrial disease. I like dire straits. But, uh, it's, uh, it is a problem. Now, we have to work together. I was supported by the Longshoremen's Union of Canada. And you know, I was the biggest opponent to the expansion of port development in Delta. And the reason being is my fellow workers, union, I'm a union guy, said, we have our jobs. I'm, we're just as concerned about our community as you are. And I think it's important that you sit down with the union. You know, the, the steel workers and the operating engineer, engineers fought hard to stop temporary foreign workers in the Chinese-owned HD mining up at, you know, the north. They fought that fight. 
And yet, I have documentation here from the Port of Vancouver, I'll be very brief, who are involved in auxiliary uh, activities over here. And they're saying as initial step, Port Metro Vancouver proposes that the federal government give the province increasing flexibility to manage the supply of temporary foreign workers. This is your ports. The government should also look to partnering abroad to develop accreditation mechanism for those looking for work in Canada. This will allow workers to meet Canadian training requirements before they arrive. Taking these steps will mitigate risk, investment, and money in bringing temporary foreign workers to Canada. It will also provide for a more effective and safe working environment for those temporary foreign workers who choose to come here. Port Metro, make no bones about it. They're here to make money. They don't give a damn about the environment, the health, or worker safety. Foreign workers, they're coming. With, I mean, the, the steel workers lost the fight. The court case was finished on May 24. We lost it. 250 Chinese temporary workers are now coming to work in the mines. And don't think for a second that they may not be the Texas. That's not far reaching. That's the mandate of Port Metro. So I think it's time to talk to the union and understand why is it in British Columbia, why isn't British Columbia? Firefighters have presumption laws. In other words, you get cancer after you retire because you don't know what you're doing as best as you're fighting a fire. They get protection. Where's the protection for the workers here as we be dealing with the coal? You have to stand up for the workers and they have to know why you're standing up to them because you share this community. You have to work together. And I, I, I bring that to you. There's also many other issues here. I mean, your, your district council should be asking the question, Delta, you know, we have the, the largest coal facility here in the West Coast of America, it's in Canada right now. You know the cost of us in hazmat and firefighting, ensuring the safety? It's, it's ridiculous. We have 110,000 people. We have a small community in Metro Vancouver, but we bear the costs. Those are questions you're going to have to ask. And you're going to have to ask with your brothers and sisters who are union members because their health is as important as yours. Thank you again for inviting me. So, okay, our uh, Powell River folks need to go. Thank you so much for being here. why this is all happening and, and of course it's because of money and people need jobs and there's and there's things that are opposite to that where we would lose lives and possibly just our health. I mean it's not a big deal is it? Um, I have a possible solution and in terms of what we can do rather than what is because we already know all that stuff. We know we want to do something, and we want to have something to do that will possibly help the situation. And um, CAN is actually, in my opinion, a very good venue and a facilitator for what can happen here. I do not believe that a town hall meeting is of any use at this time. The reason why is everybody's got a lot of opinions, a lot of emotion, and no answers. Okay, so what you have is a bunch of people that are, they, they're just going to yell at each other and they're going to be mad at each other and they're going to say, how come you're, you're, you're being treasonous to me? I, I work there and I need this. And the other person says, well, don't you understand why? We not know all this stuff. It's not going to work as far as I'm concerned. I've seen too many of these here and in other places as well, uh, all over you know, the eastern slopes of Alberta where the mining companies have gone in and basically totally destroyed all the way from uh, Grand Cache down to Calgary. If you look at, uh, you go away from the, the roadways, you'll find that only 500 feet away are wastelands that look like the bloody moon. 
Uh, I believe that this should consist, the meeting should consist of the uh, regional board, parts of, uh, somebody from the health department, including our, our own doctor and, and possibly people who are involved with, uh, you know, the, the health thing in, with the unions. The unions definitely, uh, and the management of the, of the facility. And I don't mean just the manager there, it should be someone from upper levels of Lafarge. And finally, uh, 10 members who are informed and well versed in how to run the meeting. Uh, otherwise, what we would have would be something that would be like what we experienced here at the first LNG meeting, where there was almost fistcuffs. Uh, we don't need that. This is a very civilized little place. And I'm very proud to be a, a part of it. I have friends who are minors, and I want them to retain their jobs. I even want more people to have jobs so that we can be more prosperous, so that more kids can be at the school, so that they can live the life that we, I think, we've been trying to create here. As an artist, my whole job has been to try to raise the emotional tone of this island and the people that come here. It's not to end up with big fights and crap like that. That's too much of that that's been going on. We're not, we're not uncivilized people. So I thank you very much. Ten. <laughs> <laughs> it seems to never go home without saying something. Well, I think that, you know, when I first heard about this whole plan, my immediately reaction was, who could have thought of something like that? I mean, uh, I think the first environmental thing I ever heard of was acid rain. And didn't that come from coal fire generators? Oh. So, you know, this is a much bigger problem. When I look at it, I say, we have the least of the problem here, <laughs> but we still have a problem. But um, I look at it like this, you know, my intuition is that the Farge isn't making a whole lot of money off of this deal. And I also look at it like, that I think they think that, well, if the people don't see any coal dust in the sky, they're going to think it's all fine. And I say, well, wait a minute now. You're going to take good water and you're going to spray it on a pile of coal. <clears throat> that seems really counterproductive, really stupid, but anyway, so my thing is, you know how much it rains here and you're going to contain that water and then you're going to somehow recycle it. So you have to like evaporate it or something and then you're going to have to take that coal dust that you've evaporated from it, you have to take it and make it into blocks and then ship it. <laughs> it doesn't seem like the Farge is going to be making anywhere near <clears throat> the amount of money that it's going to take to actually protect the, the uh, runoff from that coal pile from going into the ocean. I mean, I'm more concerned about that. The, uh, our brothers and sisters living in the water than us, actually. You know, I kind of resigned myself of breathing a little cold. I didn't know, I know it's not good for me. My grandpa was a mining engineer in Drumheller. If anybody knows anything about Drumheller, that was the cold capital of Alberta back in those days. So, <clears throat> yes, a lot of people from there, most of the miners died young. That's, you know, that was expected. But anyway, I guess that um, how, where do we go from here? My issue is, you know, I don't like being lied to. You know, that's my problem with the Farge. I guess I don't have a problem with guys that work there. They're probably doing their best. Yes, and when you work for a large corporation, it's very difficult, you know, so it's not to <laughs> do too much. You know, you, you have to go, you either quit or you do the job, right? It's, you, there isn't any in between. So. Where was I going <laughs> anyway? So what my idea, what I think is, you need to somehow put the Farge 
on the spot. Okay, you say, because our doctor says, okay, you can fight from the health issue. The bar says, we got it covered. <coughs> now, I guess it depends how much you believe them. I don't believe them. Because, uh, like I say, um, it's, uh, gonna, it's not going to be something that anyone's going to even know for 20 years. You know, what we've done to the ocean or whatever. So uh, I say you need to find out from afar really what are you going to put in place? What do you, how are you going to keep this water from running into the ocean? How, how, um, so uh, what are you really going to do to, you know, to protect the, the dust from getting into the air and all that kind of stuff? It's, uh, so to me, it's not like, whether everyone on the island is for it against it. I don't care. If you can do that safely, even if it's an insane plan, well, you know, the government of the U.S. wants to do it. <laughs> Stephen Harper is not going to stop it, believe me. So, uh, well, if you can do it safely, do it. But, you know, <laughs> I don't believe what Lafar's intends on doing it safely. I mean, I shouldn't say quite that way. I mean, it's a good but point. I don't think they're making enough money to do it. Thanks. Anyone else? Yes, uh, I'm just wondering if uh, Tan has, many years ago, we beat the Vancouver garbage coming here. We also fought with forestry to keep pesticides out of Pocahontas. And we were successful on those two things. And I think the way that TAN uh, doesn't have to take sides is if they were to call a meeting, as Dobie would represent us and stuff, on the basis that we're looking at trying to make sure that we get a study done that's properly done and it's that way you're not taking sides and TAN isn't take, sound like they were taking sides. So I think that that's the basis that TAN could get involved. And I sure hope they do. Dale, Dale. I'd like to be the first volunteer to form a group that would follow up on these. And the particular one seems to be we need to come together as a community. And I would like to see two or three or four or five or ten people join me as volunteers to perhaps approach ten with a proposal to hold a town meeting. And I've heard the suggestion that we should be there. So I want to first volunteer. I hope I'm not the last. <laughs> Come on, you guys. Okay. Ready to go. So we've Two. got uh, Dale, Lefty, and we have Phyllis Souls. We're joining a group here. Is that what we're doing, Dale? This is a one-shot group oh. to approach TAN uh, with a proposal to hold a conciliatory meeting. Okay. Do we have a third person? Come on, talk. You're good. <laughs> Someone call. Good. How about you, Toby? I'm sorry, I have this. Okay. So we have two. Phyllis and Dale uh, are volunteering to do that. Is that true? And I'll hand this back to you. Okay. All right, maybe some people need a little time to think about this. Um, does anybody else want? to mention something, talk about something. Are we finishing this evening? Yeah. We're all ready to go? Okay, um, I just want to formally uh, thank Dr. Jane so very much for coming here. I, I learned a lot. Yeah. Um, thank you all. A gift here. This is actually for your lovely wife. Oh. <laughs> this is a Texada rock necklace. Thank you so much. You're, the, you're, you're very smart. That's the only way I can come. If I keep her happy, then I get to come. Yeah. <laughs>
Thank you. If you haven't already signed your name, uh, contact number, email address, please do. If you're interested in more information, um, Cora and Diana will be at the table. I think we're in the front here. Uh, leave us a, a contact number um, for where we go from here. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. Thank you.